Good morning, everybody. This is Daniel here with Propelio, and we are coming back for part three of the mobile home class. If you haven't seen part one or two, the links are available in the comment section above. Uh, but overall, we will be teaching you today the final chapter of how to create notes using mobile homes as personal property. Keep going. Oh, I thought we were doing an intro. Okay, I'll just keep going. That's what else would you like me to talk about? Before. Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right, well, we'll just keep talking. What do you like me to talk about? This is, I am so confused right now. So, so I'll bring it, uh, so I know you're fixing to do a recap, but this is where the meat and potatoes is. We've done this for three weeks. This is our third week of doing this. We've got two sections in where you've talked about how to structure these deals and how to go in and look at the price of the property. And now Daniel's going to teach us how to go in and structure the notes and get these things bought and sold. The notes, the liens, the calculating, all of the stuff in between. So we will be doing a lot of stuff on a 10B2 calculator. If you have not used a 10B2 calculator before, we'll drop a link below real fast. Um, so you can download it for your phone. It does cost $5.99, but it's worth the $5.99. We use it in our business daily. Uh, and we'll sh I'll show you today ba the basics of how to use that as well. So are we just not doing an intro or we just keep going? We've already done it. Oh, well, I didn't realize. Okay, so that, that's where I was confused. I thought we were going to talk, do the intro. All good. So that's what happened there, everybody. So let's have some fun here. So what we have up here on the slides, I'll just do a real quick recap on what we've already discussed in part one and part two. Part one was essentially going through some of the stereotypes of mobile homes, the different types, how to identify them, how to research the title of them, um, and then overall how to address and deal with the sellers the costs to move them, repair them. And now we're gonna start getting into how to determine what they're worth, how to structure your offers, how to secure your offers, uh, security agreements and all that fun stuff. So we've got the slides right here and I'm just gonna go straight into this. I don't see any point in pausing on that at all. But determining retail on a mobile home is a bit of a pain. It really is because it's personal property. It's not real property. So you don't have comparable sales like you would in the MLS. Um, some examples of that is like, I might have a two bed, two bath, you know, 12 wide here in DFW and it'd only be worth maybe eight grand. And I'm just throwing some just BS numbers out there. But I could take that same mobile home and put it in a really nice park here in DFW. And just because it's in a really nice park, that same mobile home is now worth more money because of the park that it's located in. So location's kind of similar to it as, um, how do you say that? As a house would be, but you'll see a lot of people that try and value these homes by like using Kelly Blue Book mm. or the NADA book, NADA book. You can't use those numbers to really determine what your home will be worth. They just don't function. So you have to know the parks that you're trying to mm -hmm. invest in. You have to know what type of trailer you're going to be able to put into that park and what you're going to have to do to get to that park standard to make it worth Mm -hmm. a comparable amount of money. That is exactly what you have to do. And I'll show you my process for doing that, which has nothing to do with looking comparables at all. Sometimes I will just kind of look out in the market, like on Craigslist or Facebook, right. and try and see what homes in DFW or whatever market I'm in are selling for. But overall, that is just a general number. It's not going to help me. I'll show you the process that I use to try and help me decide whether or not what I could sell this home for. Yeah, and don't get confused, there's a couple of really big folks around the Metroplex that actually all they do is buy and sell mobile homes, but they're selling land packages and stuff, and they sell at a really, really high rate mm -hmm. on these land packages because they're offering a different kind of opportunity. So you can't confuse those numbers. I know the groups are out there. I see them all the time with, uh, with what mm -hmm. Daniel's talking about. See, we, we're doing personal property in a park. When you start incorporating land into the transaction, it's a whole new ball right. game. So this entire class has been strictly mobile homes as personal property. Mobile homes attached to land and or subdividing land, adding mobile homes and or mobile home parks totally different strategy. So we are strictly doing what we call Lonnie deals. Um, if you haven't ever heard of the word Lonnie deals, Lonnie Scruggs, L-O-N-N-I-E, last name was S-C-R-U-G-G-S, -G -G was kind of the guy that pioneered teaching this strategy. I don't personally know if he's the one that pioneered the strategy itself, but he was definitely the one made famous for teaching people how to do this. But this is what I'm gonna do to determine what the house is worth. So like right here, we've got on the screen here, determining retail. Retail value would be determined by seeing what other homes of similar size and year are being sold for. Kinda, kinda yes, kinda no. Retail is less about the price and is focused more on down payment and can your buyer afford the monthly payment? So this is how I start determining what I'm gonna be able to sell my house for. So like if I take a look at a 1989 Honda Civic that's got 200,000 miles on it, 
that car might be able to be sold for 500 bucks if it's running, 800 bucks if it's running. But you'll see that same car on a tote the note car lot being sold for seven grand. Yeah. And the only reason they're able to get seven thousand dollars for that 1989 Honda is because somebody doesn't have the credit to buy their own car, and they need a car, and they can afford the weekly payment on it or the monthly payment on it. A lot of times they're weekly payments because they they pull it straight out of their paycheck, but. Selling a mobile home is kind of the similar situation what we're doing. People that are buying these mobile homes often have a credit situation, an income situation that won't allow them to get a traditional home, but they still want some of the values of home ownership. So when I'm looking at the mobile home itself, I'm gonna be like, what is the rents in the neighborhood around here like? Like if I'm in a neighborhood where I can get, you know, a typical average rental home, single family home, two bed, two bath, three bed, one bath, whatever it ends up being, whatever that neighborhood is comp compromised, uh, comprised of, whatever that word should be, um, how much is it gonna rent for? So I start looking at house rents. And now if I know that a person can rent a house in this neighborhood for let's say 900 bucks a month, I also look at the apartments in this neighborhood that are comparable. What are my apartments renting for? If my apartments are renting for let's say 750, I'm gonna probably imagine that if my mobile home park and my, and my mobile home are similar to the neighborhoods that I'm seeing these homes for rent in, same schools, same everything else, that I could probably get somewhere between, somewhere between what the apartment will rent for and what the house will rent for. Right. I can probably land somewhere in between those two. And then I use that number to figure out what I'm gonna sell the house for. Because I'm trying to normally get these notes cured between three to seven years. And, and, and what you're getting at is you're looking at most of the people that are buying at this rate are note buyers, are, are like, a, I'm sorry, a monthly. Or payment um, buyers. There you go, a payment yeah. buyer. They have a set amount they want to spend a month and they know that they can secure this house. And at the end of this note, the price is going to drastically drop and they'll be able to live even in, in a better situation. That cases. is exactly the case. So if there's anybody out there that's right now that's thinking, it's like, well, you're taking advantage of these people. You're selling them a 1982 mobile home that's probably only worth 12,000 and you're selling it to them for 35,000. Well, this is giving that person an opportunity, an opportunity that they would not have outside of this to not only own their own mobile home, but in five years, three years, have their payment go from 800 a month down to 300 a month. So, cause they still have to pay their lot rent. But there's not too many situations where somebody that has living on a fixed income and or has limited income potential to be able to take their rent from 800 a month down to 300 a month in a matter of five years. So this gives opportunity for somebody, let's say, that's on Social Security collecting a little bit of retirement income that's only bringing in, let's say, $1,500 a month, $1,800 a month. Well, if you give them a mobile home payment that's $650 a month, it might be a little tight for them for the next three years, but at the end of three years, they just secured an extra 30% of their monthly income right. uh, by, by buying this mobile home. So that's what we're doing. When we sell these mobile homes, we're not so much selling them on retail value, we're selling them on what the payment is. And I try to get the payment somewhere between three to seven years. And I kind of, I'm not gonna say I have a mathematical formula for determining that, but let's say I've got a really just Eh, looking mobile home it's not really all that great condition but I know that I can probably sell it for 700 a month well 700 a month times seven years ends up being like 55,000 60,000 or whatever that ends up being I know that people just logically in the back of their head they're like I'm not gonna pay $60,000 for that just like if I talk about that 1989 Honda Civic like I know somebody's not gonna pay me $22,000 for that 1989 sure. Honda Civic but they might be willing to pay me five because they know five is worth more than what it is, but they can afford it. But they're still going to be like, I know I can go somebody else, go to somebody else and buy a 1989 Honda Civic for five grand. I'm not paying you 22. So depending on the condition of the home, the overall the overall area, the style of it, will de determine for me like, is it a three year loan, a four year loan, a five year loan? Uh, most of my homes I sell for a bare minimum of about 20 grand. So that'll be like a three year loan on most people's payments. And then there's been some where I've sold them for 35 grand or so. <coughs> slightly nicer home, slightly nicer park, but you know the payments lasted for five years, six years. I like getting my notes to last for about five years. That's a really nice sweet spot for me. Right. Well, and it gives you a nice spot to plan on, unless they, they pay off early. But now, are you looking for a certain amount of cash flow on each one? Now, I know we talk about cash on cash return, which is different than, are you looking for $250 cash flow a month on every one of these deals for yourself? Um, some people may. I personally look for cash on cash. And the reason I'm looking for cash on cash is because these people, I'm not going to say don't have skin in the game, but it's not uncommon for these people 
Just walk. To walk. It, or I mean, they're, they're, they're typically a low credit buyer. I've only had to deal with it twice, so it's not like it's common. It's not like this is going to happen every single time. But I want to know that any money that I've put into that home, I get back real fast. So like if I put, that's one of the reasons why earlier in like part one and part two of this show, I've said, I don't really like to be into a mobile home for more than $8,000. Right. Because if I'm into it for more than $8,000, my capital that I put out, it takes longer to get it back. And the longer it takes for me to get it back, the greater my risk in this transaction is. So if I can put 8,000 into a mobile home and normally get my investment back within a year, I, I feel secure that my, I'm not gonna lose money on that deal. So part of this, part of this thing, because one of your big costs up front is moving trailers, mm -hmm. is either securing these relationships that we talked about in part one and two with other parks that'll pay to move it in and get it set up, mm -hmm. or making sure you can leave it in that park and not have a nightmare situation where you buy a trailer and realize they just want you out of there. Mm -hmm. So you gotta do your due diligence to stay in these price ranges that Daniel's talking about. And we discussed that quite a bit in part one and part two, right. and my total disclosure is I've never moved one. Uh, I, I don't, I don't really knowledge. need to. I mean, I can find them in the parks, and if I find them in the parks and the park manager's willing to work for me, it's a win-win for everybody. Now, I did teach a good friend of mine how to do this, Frank. And Frank, man, he went out there and just started killing it. He just started just going to town on it. And one of the connections he did make, which is what we we're discussing in part, I believe, too, was he started working with the mobile home movers. And that's why I incorporated this into this class is because the mobile home movers would bring him deals and he'd partner up with the parks to move them around. So all thought processes that can be had. But for those that aren't understanding and or have questions, feel free to ask questions. We are shooting this live. But overall, the way I'm determining what the retail value of that mobile home is going to be is I look at the rents of homes around there. I look at the rents of apartments in the same school district, same city, same area that, I'm, that I've got my mobile home in. And I try and make sure that my monthly payments for my mobile home, including lot rent, I need to make sure I disclose that, including lot rent, is about the same as what somebody would pay for a little bit less than a house, a little bit more for an apartment. And then from there, I just decide whether or not I really think I can sell it for 20 grand, 25 grand, 30 grand, you know. And then from there, I just throw it out into the market and see what people will bite on, you know. Depending upon the down payment, might depend upon how much of a um, three year, four year, five year plan I give them. So, something else I look at um, I generally structure my sales so that the down payment is about three times the local monthly rent. Um, excuse me? I generally structure. Uh, Excuse me, it's been a while since I've taught this class, but I generally structure my sales so that the down payment is about three times the local monthly rent and the monthly payment is more than a similar apartment but less than a similar house with a final payoff in three to five years. So that right there kind of goes through what we're saying, but I forgot to discuss the down payment aspect of it. I always want this person to have skin in the game. I do not want to let somebody else move in and be like, I'll, I'll, I'll do repairs for my down right. payment. No, you will not do your repairs for down payment. You will not move into that home until I get at least three times my monthly, my monthly rent. If it's 900 bucks a month, you know, I want $2,700 down or you're not getting the home. I let one person move in uh, with, a, with a, I'll work for a down payment thing and it bit me in the ass hard, man. Yeah, that, that, may mean the that may mean they're removing parts and selling them down yeah. there for their crystal meth habit. I mean, so. you, you really, you, you need, if you want to survive in this business, your tenant screening, your buyer screening is going to make or break your business. If you are, let's say, getting nervous because you've had it up for sale for a week and you don't have a buyer yet and you're starting to freak out like, oh no, you know, I'm never going to be able to sell this thing and you just take the next person that comes in, you will hate this business if it takes you 45 days to sell that home but you sold it to the right person you will love this business because when you go out and you sell it to the wrong person you will hate your life you will hate your life you might as well wash your hands of it let them just have the place and walk on down the road i had i had a friend of mine and this is i'm not going to go deep into this but he bought he got a home and he sold it to the wrong buyer and he lost everything, literally everything. Like he lost his business, he lost his freedom, he lost everything over one buyer, and he did nothing wrong. He just couldn't afford to defend himself. I'm not gonna disclose everything that was going on. What, what there was lawsuits involved? Yeah, uh, well, I'm not gonna get into details, okay. but- fair enough, I'm um, just trying to- Criminal charges got pressed, and when oh. criminal charges got pressed, th th essentially they, they basically said, you either give me the home or I'm gonna file charges against you. 
And he's like, well, I've done nothing. I know which case you're talking about. And you're talking about this? got the charges pressed against him, but he couldn't. Aff- he, he spent $25,000 trying to defend himself, and he could no longer afford to defend himself, so he ended up losing everything. Yeah, basically, the, the person just wanted a free house. Yeah, and that, that was very clear from the moment they moved in. Well, and that, that brings a whole different thing to to mind, which is how you, that's a different class, how you structure these deals, whether you're in series LLCs, LLCs, you're buying them with your mom's bank card. Whatever. All of that was great, but they, they brought personal charges against him. Ah, that's so right. there, okay. was, there was nothing that could be done. So doing your due diligence on your, I'm not saying this to scare you, but you do need to make sure that you, you run proper due diligence. And one of the things that I loved about this guy, and one of the things that I, mentoring him, also tried to prevent him from doing was he did a lot of his business with his heart, which I, I love and I respect because I'm a very big really? heart myself. Cost a lot but of I've, money. I've had my heart screwed over so many times doing business that you need to start thinking about business. And he, he allowed this person to move into the home without any paperwork, without any documented, documentation on anything, and it just messed the whole day up. I think the nugget there is, even though you're, you're trying to do a good job and really do business, is always protect mm-hmm. your rear. Always have to paperwork, 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 so, paperwork. If he had the paperwork, this would have went so much differently. It would have been a completely different story. So me and my wife, did, we personally had, it was a retail property, a property that we had that we owned as a rental house. Six months, no payment from a professional renter. Oh man. Um, she, she moved in, had 97 cats and smoked two packs a day, but started threatening to sue us every day for whatever her lung problems were all this stuff, and eventually I just had to wait her out. I paid my lawyer right down the street here a lot of money uh, to deal with that, and the whole time we're bleeding with another mortgage that we Mm -hmm. had to pay, and we serviced it, but these are the kind of things that I didn't have the right paperwork in place up front Mm -hmm. because I used a a paperwork that a realtor gave me instead of going to a lawyer, and this is what happens when you deal with true ignorance, you're just going into something without any thought process in it. So, so many people disregard the importance of the paperwork. You know, the paperwork makes or breaks the transaction. Sure. When a transaction goes well, paperwork doesn't matter. But whenever the transaction goes south, it's the paperwork that's going to completely and totally change the outcome of your business. So, paperwork's extremely important. We'll discuss a lot about that here in a bit. And, and, and to be fair, a lot of the, I want to be clear because I just put this out here, a lot of the fault held, held li- 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 with my property management mm-hmm. that I had in place, that I didn't vet well enough, that I didn't have, they didn't have enough systems to deal with things. So, so bad move all the way around, but back to it. Do we have any questions before I move forward from here? Yeah. Can I ask one question from the audience too? Because this is going to come up later. Ask Daniel for permission to ask this later. But how many, of all the people that are watching today, maybe, I don't know if y'all are tire kickers, or you're going to move on this stuff. Um, but I guarantee you the 20% that do have a better chance than the 80% that don't. How many of these deals do y'all think y'all can do this year right now? He's talking about $10,000 deals. How many $10,000 checks can your grandma write you to do these deals this year? And it's not even $10,000 checks because your first one you stroke, let's say it is a $10,000 check, but if I'm dropping ten grand, I expect to get probably about half of that back, maybe a little bit less back at closing. So I'm really only having to outlay about five grand at a time that turns back into residual income to me. Um, so with about 20 grand, you can really get quite a bit of mobile homes done. Um, but I'd say the average person should be able to knock out at least one a quarter if they're just saving up some money and just doing diligence with it at least one a quarter. I actually did a class on just that, how to retire yourself in like two years using mobile homes. And I went through the strategy of using mobile homes to retire yourself, because that's exactly how I got out of the rat race. Is that in the Propelio Academy? That's not in the Propelio Academy. That's here on Propelio TV on a previous show. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll find a find a link to it. I'll put that back in there. But um, this is a simple way to retire yourself. This is exactly how I got out of the rat race. What's up, Ryan? Um, a couple questions. Uh, Paul from Houston, do you insure your mobile homes that you buy? I personally did not. Um, I was okay with risk, the risk involved with it and with me being the bank and not the landlord, I didn't really have trip and fall hazards or any of the concerns from that angle. So the hassle of finding an insurer that would insure a 1983 mobile home um, versus, um, versus the the pain of trying to manage and keep the insurance in place with my tenants versus my buyers, they're technical, technically not tenants, with my buyers was a lot more troublesome than the actually um, taking the risk of just not having the insurance on it. 
At what point do I need to become a broker, if ever? It varies from state to state, but in Texas, if you sell more than one mobile home in a trailing 12 month period, you have to become a broker. Mobile home or mobile home park? Mobile home. Mobile home park's different. The, the trailing 12 month is very important there. That's not a calendar year. Mm -mm. That's not your fiscal year for your company. That's in a 12 month and that thing moves as you go. Mm -hmm. So you can't get slick with that. But I can buy one, my wife can buy one, my dad can buy one, my company can buy one, my other company can buy one. And that's not me saying this is how you should get around it. If you're trying to get into this business and the broker aspect of it has got you concerned, but you want to get your feet wet and see if you like this business, that's exactly what I did. I did a transaction, my wife did a transaction, my dad did a transaction, my business did a transaction. And after I started going through and I did about four or five, I was like, you know what, this business works. And then I went down to Austin, I got licensed, I got all of my, all of my stuff put together and I became a broker. Did got you, an attorney question. What's up? Can I do this as a sole proprietor, proprietor or do I have to have uh, an LLC? That is strictly up to your risk tolerance. Uh, the LLC will shield your personal assets. If you have no personal assets, you know, that's, that's, that's a personal decision that you'll need to make yourself. I would always advise that somebody that is educated on how to run an LLC, because you, there are specific things that have to be done to keep an LLC legit, get the LLC going. But if you have no clue how to keep an, a corporate veil up to date and you have no personal assets, maybe start developing some assets and then protect them. But that's not my legal opinion. How much cash would you want to be able to start doing all this? Uh, a minimum of probably five to eight grand, but doesn't necessarily have to be cash. I chose earlier in part two not to, not to discuss credit cards in this transaction, but if you have 5,000 or 7,000 available on a credit card, Let's say, and I'm just going to throw a hypothetical out there and I'll let you figure it out in your own brain so I'm not sitting here telling you to use your credit card to do this. But let's say I have a credit card and they charge me 24% interest and I've got 7000 in the line of credit on there and I use that $7,000 to secure and renovate a, a mobile home and I'm able to turn around and sell that mobile home for twenty five grand, and I'm able to make 117% interest on it. Does it really matter if I have to pay 24% on the credit card? No, because I just made 25 grand and I'm making 117 percent cash on cash. I will easily pay that credit card off if I am if I'm being diligent about taking the payments coming in from my mobile home and using those to pay off my credit card. Then that credit card did what it was supposed to do. And that gives me an advantage when people use credit cards to go out and buy doodads, as rich dad would call it, then you're not using credit cards for the right thing. But if you use that credit card and you go out and buy a mobile home and that mobile home provides a better return than what that credit card costs do it all day long can you use an rbi to sell them for you and then follow up ryan what is an rbi rbi is a retailer broker installer and they are a broker and my understanding and it's been probably like four years since i've done the class is that a broker can broker the transaction for you but you still can only sell one per every 12 month period unless you like inherited it and you can do more than one but i'm not too clear on that, but yeah, you can use a broker to broker, but you can still only do one if I remember. It seemed like it'd be easier just to go take that class for two or three days. It costs you like two grand, 2,500 bucks to get the license in the class. Uh, so if I'm not a broker, can I, and this is from Paul, uh, so if I'm not a broker, I can personally only do one in a year, but I can legally have an LLC per MH, per mobile home, and not trigger the broker requirement? I would say technically you are probably right, but if you're going to start doing multiple transactions and you get to a point where you've done four or five or six and you're going to stay in this business, go get licensed because despite the, in my opinion, this is my opinion, is despite the technicality of what you have done, if I was standing in front of a judge, I don't believe that Hard judge would for, a, would, would, would for a single minute believe that I was staying within the letter. Of, I was staying within the letter of the law, but not the intent of the law. And I would much, I'd feel much better standing in front of a judge if I had my RBI. So we good? All right. Any questions before I keep going? No, have we got any, anybody back that said uh, how many they thought they could do a, a year? Does anybody comment on that? You got Richard Wilkin on YouTube saying 15. That sounds very possible. 15, my average cash flow, which everybody talks about, was probably around 350 bucks per unit. At 350 to 400 bucks per unit, if you did 15 of them, you'd be bringing in an extra $6,000 a month in income. $6,000 a month in income would retire most people. The way I was able to go through Rich Dad education and achieve the Rich Dad Hall of Fame was because I was able to get out of the rat race in under six months. 
And the way I was able to get out of the rat race in under six months was through mobile homes. I was buying, generating notes, and the cash from the notes was cost more. The income from my notes generated more than my monthly expenses. Therefore, I was technically retired by the time I was like 28. Well, maybe you guys need to start a Propelio Hall of Fame. You're giving this stuff away for free. You're not charging 40000 for a bullshit training cycle that people are just getting sucked into, and you never really get to the top of it. I'm not talking about the rich dad. I don't know shit about it. I'm just saying, excuse my language. I'm sorry, I forgot I'm not on, I'm not in, everybody's here. I'm just, my point is, you're giving this stuff away for free, so maybe y'all should start a Propelio. We've been thinking know, about it. Like, there's a lot of people that take this knowledge and do something with it. I showed Daniel my notes from a year ago, from watching one of his videos, and I came to a mastermind to ask him questions. I love it, man. I, I, I love nothing more about this than seeing people that take action on what we've taught them and they go out and perform on it. And then eight months later, I've never even met somebody before. And they come up to me like, hey, I watched a video you did, man. And look at this. I just cashed a check. And it's just like, wow, that's that's amazing to see something like that happen. But we uh, we do have the Propelio Academy. For those that haven't heard about it, go out, check out Propelio Academy. It is free education. The stuff that we're talking about today is like already recorded and out there on the Academy. So if you want to learn more about real estate, go check out the Academy. Academy. What's uh, up, Ryan? Melissa Farr, she was saying she's her, her goal is five. Mm -hmm. uh, she's just learning, but she's ready to do this. So let's let's continue moving forward. Yeah, I retired myself with about 12 of them. It took me about 12 and then I was retired. Um, so let's keep moving forward. Before I forget, I want to say hi to my kiddo. Hey, hey, Tyler. Tyler watches my show every Monday. So whenever she's at home and she misses daddy, I make sure I try to tell her hi when I'm out here on the on the show. So how am I going to calculate my profit and my cash flow on these deals? What am I going to, how am I going to determine, you know, I've determined how, what retail was, what were we doing? We we're just basically figuring out what the payment on the house would be and then making sure it could be paid off in three to five years. Not exact rocket science, but 20 grand was my average sale price. 20 to 25 grand was my average sale price with some of them hitting 30 to 35. But how am I going to calculate my profit and cash flow? This is where the 10B2 financial calculator comes into place. So. If I go ahead, could you show my screen for me real quick? If I take a look at my screen right here, I've got the application. Like, if you, I don't know if it works on an iPhone. I definitely know it works on an Android. Got it right here. So yeah, like he's got it right here on his phone. I've got it on my phone. I believe it is like the absolute necessity for anybody in this business to have. But that 10B2 financial calculator can be got. Can, can be got. You can get it in the Google Play Store. Uh, it's 10. The, the number 10, the lowercase b, lowercase i, lowercase i, that thing is a lifesaver, not only in mobile homes, but anything you're dealing with, it involves payments. So if you're in the note business or you're into creating notes through creative financing, this application is a must. If you don't know how to use it, I'll give some of the basics on it today, but Grant Kemp from creativecashflow.com did a class in the Propelio Academy. Once again, it is free, and he teaches you how to use the 10B2 financial calculator. So if you don't know how to use this, I will touch base on it a little bit here in today's class, but if you want to learn more about it, definitely check out the Propelio Academy and the 10B2 financial cal calculator class. But that's what we're about to use, and I want anybody that's out there with one, and I see that you have yours here with you today, to let's go ahead and go back to the slides, and I want you to work through some of these math problems with me real quick. So calculating profit and cash flow. Here's some, some real life examples of some units that I have done. I did a cash purchase on a mobile home for 1200 bucks, and I put about 4000 in repairs into it. All in, I'm at 5200 bucks. I'm going to take this slow because we will be dealing with a lot of numbers on this particular slide, but I want everyone out there, if they have the opportunity to follow along with me and keep up with this math, and if the questions are popping up, hit me up with them as I go through because I want you to understand this part of the business because it's this part of the business that's going to set you up, and I need to make sure that I'm setting you up well. So if I buy it for 1200 bucks, and if I remember right, this was a mid 80s mobile home. I don't rem I remember the unit, I don't remember the age, but it was 1200 bucks and I put about 4000 into it, all in 5200 and it was a really nice looking unit was done. All new paint on the outside, new flooring on the inside, and it was overall, you know, a quality unit. I wouldn't mind living there. 5200 bucks all in. And I turned around and I sold it on a $24,000 note. So, this is where we're going to start using our 10B2 financial calculator. So, for those of you that have your 10B2 out, there's going to be a button up at the top that says PV. And that's going to be your present value. Let me get mine open real quick so I can follow along with you. But 10B2 financial calculator. 
While he's doing that, if y'all ever see Scott Horn, look at that 10 B2 he carries around. He doesn't even have numbers on it anymore. It's like um, an antique. He, it's always in his pocket. He does, he does, yeah, so for those that don't know Scott Horn, he is kind of a DFW legend in the creative financing and note world. Dude is sharp as can be. And you will never meet that man without him having a financial calculator in his pocket. And he actually uses the 12C. We use 10B2s. He's old school. He likes the 12C. But like literally, like he was just saying, man, if you're ever talking to Scott, you will almost guarantee if you start pulling numbers, he will immediately pull it out, stop making eye contact with you, and just look down at his calculator. Boom, 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 boom. And then before you know it, he's telling you all kinds right. of stuff that you never knew. But so we sold this thing for 24 grand. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put $24,000 into my present value. And you do need to watch that class from Grant Kemp in the Academy if you do not know how to use a, a financial calculator. Uh, where did I lose my button thingy to? There's my button. As you can tell, we're super, super professional up here. We're up here having fun. $24,000 on the resale, $2,000 down. So how much did I have into this unit up front? 5,200. 5,200 bucks. And then if I got 2,000 down, how much of capital did I have at risk? 3,200. 3,200 bucks. That's all that I had. So maybe I put 5,200 out at first and I spent two to three weeks making some repairs to the property, another two to three weeks to get it sold. So overall, maybe two months, month and a half, two months, I've got $5,200 out in the world. But whenever I turned around and sold it, I got 2,000 of that back immediately. So I've only got $3,200 at risk. And if you're not understanding that, follow along with me, ask questions. But really, at the point in time I sold this property, my, my total money at risk was $3,200. Sold it for 24,000 with 2,000 down. So I financed $22,000 to these people. So my present value of the note would actually be $22,000. What term did I offer them? Five years at 6%. So five years is how many months? 50, 60 months. 60 months. So on the, in your 10B2 calculator in the top left-hand corner, you're gonna have a big N. N is in Nancy. I'm gonna put 60 months on Nancy. And then right next to that, you're gonna have I slash YR. That's your interest slash yield. And I might have that completely wrong, but one of the nice things about this is you don't really need to know how it does what it does. Right. You just need to know how to do it. What you do need to know is how to hit clear on this thing, to all clear that. And you <laughs> have to use that function button. It's either an orange or a blue one on mine. And then hit clear. It's orange and, and uh, C to clear all if you type it in wrong. See, I didn't know that. I've never done that before. See, so, you I, don't have to. Don't be. Don't be. You know, when you open this up, this thing looks crazy. There's like, yeah. there's, 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 there's foreign language on this thing that I don't understand. I did not make it through high school, so I am not an intelligent individual when it comes to this kind of stuff. So when you open this thing up and it looks extremely confusing, you only need like five buttons on this thing. I, I've owned this app for like five months and been scared of it. I've been doing it through a mortgage calculator, yeah. like reverse engineering this stuff. This is so much easier, man. And Daniel just made me open it the last time I was here and showed me that we are only using the top line, yeah. essentially. And it took me like three minutes to understand this, and then I felt like an idiot. So It is super easy to use if you don't let all the stuff there confuse you because it does look a little intimidating. It looks like damn near a graphing calculator. Yes. But all I need to do is put in the present value of the note, the PV. Okay. I need to put in the number of payments, which in this case, five years. It's always done in months, so I need 60 months worth of payments and, on there. And you'll see it fill in right above on this app, right above that letter you push. When you hit in, 60 fills in right above it. 22,000 fills in right above yeah. PV. And I love that. And then I need to know what the interest was. So if I type in 6%, just 6, and I put that in the I slash YR, and then I hit the payment button, the PMT button, I now know that my payment on that unit is going to be $425.32. So right here, I went ahead and rounded it down. My payment is $425 per month for that unit. Okay? It's awesome. And then I come back through lot rent for that particular unit was 325 a month total payment for that was 750 bucks a month which was right in line with my rents for that particular neighborhood this was wilmer texas 750 bucks is all you were going to get in wilmer texas but that right there is how i was able to determine that but if i look at that i put 5200 dollars in cash into it up front and excuse me if y'all keep on seeing me pointing over this way i've got a i've got a reference monitor over here that i keep pointing at but i'm all in at 5200 bucks and I got 2,000 down, my exposed capital is $3,200. If I've got $3,200 exposed 
and I'm collecting $425 per month off of that note. Remember, my lot, my total payment includes lot rent. So I, my total payment doesn't go to me. The only thing that goes to me is that $425 per month. So follow me on that. What is my cash on cash returns for this particular unit? Well, you're about eight months and you're cashed out on that one. About eight months and you're cashed out on that one. So how much risk do I have in that? I just need to make sure that I get a tenant in place that pays me on time for eight months and then everything from that moment going forward is free money. So so not, not to dumb this down too much here because I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but when you, when you look at this, like, I mean, essentially at eight months, you turn this into an ATM. It's, it's I, I, one of the, I don't, I'm not trying to pimp anybody here. One of the first lawyers I talked to when I got into this, the, uh, he told me, he said, Jason, why aren't you looking at mobile homes? I have the notes the page before yours from our meeting. Yeah. So it's very first started. And I said, well, I don't know. You know, they're kind of trashy. They're kind of this. He's got a Humvee parked in front of his law office right down the street here. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I've got 200 doors. Dang. And um, I buy them all the time for $5,000. Even then, I didn't understand it. Like, you're the only one that's helped me clear this up. And he explained it to me. I'd probably be debt free right now if I'd, if I'd understood what he was telling me or spent more time over there. For anybody that looks at this from the asset itself, is doing themselves a disservice when they ignore the numbers. Because this business isn't sexy when you look at the asset class. This business is sexy when you look at the returns. And if you are able to understand how to understand and run these numbers, you will quickly find the power in mobile homes. Um, like I've done somewhere probably between 30 to 40 of them. I haven't done 200 by any means. Uh, and I'd, I'd be interested in having a conversation with him. That's that's an intriguing situation. But I, I don't know how many doors are actually mobile homes because he's bought with multiple right. family twos, but mm -hmm. he was all in. He said, Jason, these things are cash cows. They are. You're missing a huge opportunity and, and I'm going after them. And some people would probably be nervous and or pissed that I'm sitting here teaching this because it is an asset class that not many investors dig into because of it's not a sexy asset. Well. It's not would, flipping. It's not. It's, it's not HGTV. You're not going to see flipping mobile homes on HGTV. So there's not as much interest there. So those people that are going to get pissed or don't have an abundance mentality. They also don't understand that, like we talked about earlier, eighty percent of the people that are watching this aren't going to do nothing with it. Mm -hmm. Of those eighty percent, of the twenty percent that do, eighty percent of them will give yeah. up before they accomplish it. Of the 20% that didn't give up, 80% of them will do it once and they wouldn't have listened to everything that was told to them. They'll make some mistakes and give up on it. And by the time it's all whittled down to the end of it, those people that are actually out there grinding and hustling and taking action on what they're being taught, the Corey Thompsons of this world, the, the Brandon Richards of this world, the people that are out there and actually getting after it, the people like yourself that are going out, gathering this information and implementing it, that's what this show is for. But Let's look at this, because we still haven't answered this question. For anybody out there in the Facebook and YouTube world, do we have any shirts that we can give away or maybe a book or something like that? Yeah. What I want to see is if we can get somebody off of Facebook or YouTube uh, to give me what the cash on cash returns are for this particular unit. Remember these key things. I put 5200 in up front and I got 2000 down. So my exposed capital is 3,200 bucks. So I'm gonna run all of my numbers based on $3,200 all in on this unit. And I collect 425 per month. So if I collect $425 per month, what, what is my annual cash on cash return? So what I'm gonna do over here is I'm gonna take 425 times 12 months because that's gonna be my annual return. I brought in $5,100. And if I've got 3,200 into it, Let's see what that ends up being. 3,200. I'm not gonna give y'all answers, so if y'all are out there thinking I'm about to give you the answer, I'm not. I'm just gonna get my own answer to, to verify for you. You can tell me if mine's right. Yours is not right. Oh, snap. <laughs> Divided by. I told you I'm not that smart. This is a lot of calculator out here. This is like a space shuttle. Well, let's see here. <laughs> 425 a month times 12 months equals 5,100. So. 159%. 3,200 divided by 5,100. 159%. 159% cash on cash returns. Who, who answered that? You've got Sahail and Jeremiah both Ooh. got it right. Well, let's get them both something. Let's, I'll get, get, them, let's get both something out hey, of that. Hey, Sahail, Jeremiah, hit me up in the DMs. This is Ryan, and I'll get you some free stuff. So awesome job out there. So 159% cash on cash return. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 425 
times 12 months. And that's going to be the total amount of money that came in. And I'm going to divide that by the amount of money that I have out. So 5,100 divided by 3,200 equals 1.59, 159%. So a lot of people, when they start doing that, because the returns are so great, they think that the little number needs to be on the top or the bottom or whatnot, and they, they flip the two numbers around. That's what I did. But it's, yeah, it's, but, but the return on that's 159%. So if you're out there and you've got an IRA or you've got some other stock or asset class that you're putting money into, let's say you're generating notes or you're putting out second mm -hmm. liens, gap funds, and you're excited about the 12% you're getting off of that, if you diverted that cash into mobile homes, and this is not <coughs> me being your financial advisor or anything else other than I've done this myself and it worked for me. But if you start putting some of that money into this, I don't know of too many places where you can have some security and still achieve triple digit returns on your investment. 159% return, that is an actual deal that I did. Let's run through two more scenarios and I'm gonna start showing you the difference in what I pay for the unit. As I start paying more for the unit, you'll start seeing my cash on cash drop. And that's where that $8,000 number of mine comes into play is because once I start breaking that 8,000 number, I start hitting double digit returns. And if you're okay with double digit returns, go for it. But I wanted triple digit returns, so I tried to stay around eight grand or less. When you find somebody though, to, to stay at eight grand or less, took a lot more effort to find the unit. Okay. I'm not going to say finding units for 8,000 and less is easy, but anything worth getting normally is not easy. But I was able on average to probably pull off two to three a quarter uh, at that price point. And I wasn't super hitting that hard. I was still doing rehabs. I was still flipping. Um, I was still doing wholesaling. But this was my, my cash flow. This was my monthly income because I don't like being a landlord. I regret that. I regret saying that today. Hindsight being 2020, I would have changed some quite a few things up in my investing strategies. But I did not like being a landlord, but this was how I created passive income was through mobile homes. Let's take a look at another unit that I did. Purchased it for 6,000, put 2,000 in repairs into it. I was about 8,000 all in. Sold it for 29,000 on a resale with 3,000 down and I financed 26 grand. I'm gonna pause right there for everybody out there in the world of YouTubes and Facebook. What is my exposed capital right now? 5,000. 5,000. And the way I was able to determine that is I put 8,000 into the unit, and then whenever I sold it, I got 3,000 down, leaving my total exposed capital at five grand. And I generated a $26,000 note. Let's just pause on that for a second and say, hell yeah. I just created cash from nowhere. Nowhere. My net worth at the beginning of this transaction, if my net worth at the beginning of this transaction was $8,000, and I generated a $26,000 note out of that eight grand, my net worth almost tripled. Right. And, and the key to that is, is, well, they're probably not gonna refi out of this kind of situation. That's never gonna happen. But even if they did tomorrow, he would generate all that as cash in his pocket. All cash, or I could sell the note. I could, I could capitalize this in several ways. I could sell the note, I could collect, keep the income. There's several things have, I could do. Have there. you ever sold any of these notes? I have sold four or five, well, not a whole lot. Do they sell at a high? high no, premium? it was about 50%. 50%. But at 50%, still 50% yep. of 26 grand is 13,000. I was only into it for five. Right. So then you just release your risk right there. And mm -hmm. you, I mean, that, that's a good deal all the way around. So imagine if you've created 35, 40 of these notes over the course of two years, and then all of a sudden you need some cash. Boom, turn around, sell it and put $80,000 in your pocket, 90,000, 150,000 in your back pocket off of a bunch of mobile homes that everybody else out there said they didn't want to buy. Was it, e was it easy to sell? Uh, I had found a buyer, he was out of Nevada. Uh, he wouldn't pay premium by no means, sure. but still whenever- Because the asset class, I'm sure. Everybody watching right now should be very well aware that it is illegal to pull out your printer and start printing off dollar bills. What is not illegal Correct. is to grab out your <laughs> HP printer and print off promissory notes. Yes. And whenever I generate that promissory note, that promissory note is an asset. In and of itself, it is an asset. And that asset has cash value attached to it. It might have only cost me 19 cents to print it. But at the point in time I printed that 19 cents worth of paper, I just created $24,000 worth of yeah. net worth. Yeah. That 
that $26,000. That is the power of mobile homes is I don't know of too many places where I can drop five grand and really quickly turn around and sell it for 26,000 and have an asset in my hand that has you know, true value to it. Yeah, one of those things will get the Secret Service to come to your house. <laughs> it's not a promissory note. The promissory note, <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, there is nothing wrong with what's going on there. Um, you might have a lawyer bring in the Texas Finance Sorry. Code, the TFC chapter, I think it's chapter 341, 347 of the Texas, Texas Finance Code. You might need to become a lender. You might need some of this. You might need some of that. Get with your own legal team. Do not take this entire class as, you know, Daniel said this, Daniel said that. Get your own advisors, get your own team, get your own financial advisors, your own legal. But by the time you are done watching this, you should have a very good understanding of how to structure these transactions, how to pull off these types of deals. And if you implement them and you put the right team around you, you can get very, very, very successful with this in a short period of time. The competition in this particular asset class is not as high. Back to the, back to the formula. 8,000 all in, 29, 29 on the resale, 26 financed, my exposed capital is five grand. Once again, I sell it on terms. The terms on this particular scenario were five years at 9%. So the present value of my note is 26,000. I'll put that into my financial calculator, into the PV. Uh, my terms for the year stayed the same, so I'll leave 60 months in on the number of payments, but my interest rate changed, so I'm gonna change my interest rate up to 9%. And what's my payment gonna be on that, Mr. Jason Witherspoon? Oh, snap, I'm, I'm still trying to work this year. That's all good. Oh, C payment. For anybody out there in the Facebook world, see if you can get that one too. Five thirty nine seventy two. Five hundred and thirty nine dollars and seventy two cents. Do you like this or what? I do. I love this calculator. This yeah. calculator is the lifeblood of anybody that deals with notes. I, I like anything that makes me look smart. It, this thing is awesome, man. I love it. <laughs> it's like when you pull it out, there's like I, I, I literally have zero clue, but there's like Greek on here. I think it's Greek. And if you hit those the buttons on there, the blue and the and the orange ones, they get even weirder. So it's just real? a heads up. Yeah. You've been pushing buttons that I didn't. Oh wow. Dude, you just broke my calculator. Yeah, yeah, it, uh, it gets real weird real quick. Um, I think I fixed it. Don't don't have me pushing buttons anymore. This calculator is super powerful. I have no clue how to do 99.9% .9 of what needs to be, what can be done with this. What I do know is the five buttons that I need to know to use this, and it makes my life easier. So go out there, download it. I don't get any any kickbacks for you buying this thing, but it's worth it. It's $5.99. Skip Starbucks for a day. So $539 per month is what my, let's just think about that for a second. How many people out there in the single family world are purchasing single family rentals? And I'm gonna go through the, and this is not me trashing Lifestyles Unlimited, but how many people are going into Lifestyles Unlimited to buy a single family home and they're looking to spend $30,000 cash out of pocket to generate 300 bucks a month in passive income on a rental that's truly not passive income, and it's truly not income, it's just it's just escrow for future repairs. I, I this have, is true passive income. I have this talk with people every week. People, what y'all have taught me, what Corey's taught me, like mm -hmm. I've gotten a wealth of knowledge from Corey. Now I understand that, you know, I, my dream used to be to have a whole bunch of stacked single family homes. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of risk in that, there's a lot of other stuff in there, there's a lot of goodness in single family homes. But if you can buy 10 trailers for the price of one single family home, I promise the cash flow is going to be higher. Cash flow is going to be much, much higher. Now, this will be me sidelining for just a split second because I am a big fan of single family rentals. Yeah, no, no. I am no. a big fan of single family rentals. I didn't used to be. Didn't used to be at all because I wasn't mature enough as an investor. Single family rentals have their place, mm -hmm. and I don't believe they are in this current market cycle. I believe that single family rentals, and I'll debate somebody on this all day long, if you are looking to leverage, grow, and accelerate your income as fast as possible, single family rentals are great for a down market. You purchase your inventory, and you wait for your market to shift. As the market's going up, you've already got your rehab inventory ready. As the market peaks, rehab them all off, sell off, and move into a cash position. Wait for the market cycle to drop again, pick up your inventory, rent them out until the market cycle goes back up again, and just continue moving down that train, and you will move into the eight figures fast. The other thing I, I, I would say about single family home, you talk about selling notes and stuff, but if you buy a single family home at the right price, if you're waiting on the right deal, 
you can always fire sell a single family home as long as you're buying in the right price package and still get your money back when you're in that pinch and you need that cash. I agree with that, but I believe that there are, and I don't want to sideline this too much, but I believe that there are right cycles for right sure. strategies. All strategies work in all cycles, but specific strategies have a better place in specific cycles. Anybody who wants to disagree with me on that, I will gladly debate them yeah. on that. But all cycles, um, all cycles have a specific strategy that works well in that cycle. And I think single family rentals are best for a down market cycle. So for those of you that are out there, if you believe in what I've said or don't believe in what I've said, drop some comments below, throw out what you gotta throw out there. We're gonna come back right after this short break and continue the mobile home class. For those of you that are watching, if you like what you're seeing, please like it, share it, subscribe. If you're not getting notifications from us on Facebook, we're at facebook.com forward slash Propelio app. If you don't get notified about us on there, go to Propelio dot tv which is our youtube channel and you can subscribe to us on youtube and youtube if you just go over there and hit the little bell they will Absolutely. notify you every time we go live and, and if you get youtube premium you can download these and watch them any other time like yeah. a podcast so for anybody out there podcasts for anybody out there watching us on youtube go out there like and share and we'll see you right after the end of this short break Hey everybody, welcome back from that short break. And where we left off was we were looking at deal number two here on the um, on the numbers. For those of you out there that are right-brained and hate numbers, my apologies here, but you right-brained people are gonna have to bear with this and learn a little bit of numbers if you're gonna get into this, this type of deal. But we've already determined now what my monthly income off of that note generated would be, and that's $539 per month. And the lot rent on that particular one was $425 a month which made my total payment for that unit $964 a month. There might be some people out there in the, on the podcasts or in YouTube or Facebook that are like, who in their right mind is gonna pay $1,000 a month to live in a mobile home? What I have to say is this particular one was in Denton, right off of Teasley Lane and I-35. The homes in that area bare minimum, 17, 1800 bucks a month. Really great schools, really great neighborhood. For the single mother that's living on a fixed income that really wants their children to be in this school district is gonna move into that unit all day long to give their children a better school district because that's what they can afford. So for those out there that are scared, oh, well no one would ever pay this much money for it. Find out what your rents are in the neighborhood Find out what your rents are for apartments, for, for homes, and if your particular mobile home park allows rentals in it, that's your best market. That's your absolute best market. So if your mobile home park allows rentals, ask the landlords, what do they rent for? And you can expect to probably sell yours for the same as they're renting for, or maybe yep. just a little bit more. So. You also need to check and make sure they allow you to sell trailers in their park too. That's very yeah. important. That was covered in, I believe, section one and two because it is the most important part of this transaction. Park managers will make or break your business. But looking out there again, what is my cash on cash returns gonna be for this unit? 129%. Man, I got another one wrong. I'm all hosed up here. All right, so let's, let's, let's run through that math real quick. If you got that wrong, then I'm not teaching this right. So. I'm glad y'all got the dumb guy in today. <laughs> it's all dumb. good, man. 539 per month. So times 539 12. times 12 I got is 64. 6468 per year gotcha. in income. All right. And you're out 4000 on this. I'm sorry. I'm out. 6000 6000 Oh, no, 5000 5000 5000 About 5000 yeah, you're right. 1.29. 129% so. cash on cash return. So, so out there in the in the in the internet, if y'all didn't follow what we did, we paid 8,000 all in for the unit, and we got 3,000 down. So my capital invested is about five grand. At five grand, I had generated 539 a month in income. That 539 a month in income times 12 months 
ends up being $6,468 a year in revenue. Now do remember, I am not a landlord. I am the bank. I'm not dealing with tenants, tools, or trash. 110%, this is income. Guaranteed income outside of default. No air conditioners to worry about, nothing else to worry about. So I generated $6,468 a year in net revenue off of that. And I've only got 5,000 invested in that. So I'm gonna divide that number by 5,000. And that's gonna be 1.29, which transitioned into a um, percentage is 129%. That is how we're determining our cash on cash. My qualifications for purchasing a unit is I needed to be at least 100% cash on cash. I didn't want any of my money exposed for more than a year. So if it had less than 100% cash on cash, I typically would not have done the deal. So you following me? I am. I'm gonna right. get the next one right, at right. least on the second try. Let's get this next one in there. And I'm gonna start showing you a little bit of a difference on what the numbers look like. 12,000 purchase, no repairs. This was a double wide that I bought. I actually lost a lot of money on this deal. Full disclosure, I lost a lot of money on that deal, but it was not because of me. It was because of outside influences that I could not control. Sold on a 33K resale. Hypothetically, I lost a lot of money on that deal. Well, um, on paper. No, I lost a lot of money on that deal. <laughs> I lost, I say a lot of money. Hi, in, in relation to what I invested, to That's what I mean. lost, I lost probably about eight grand on that deal. You have 12,000 max that you could lose from the top tier of numbers there compared to the 33 that you're gaining. So in. what happened on that one is the weekend I bought it caught on fire. Well, that's so a problem. my investment went downhill real fast. And then the park manager was, was, was really backdooring me hard with the sale of this property. And by the time it was said and done, was I just sold it for cash to walk off and just cut bait. So this is what the deal would have looked like had I not got into all of that trouble. So 33,000 was what I was anticipating the resale to be. With 5,000 down, it was a nicer neighborhood. Finance 28 grand, five years at 9% again, 581 a month in income, 425 a month in lot rent. These were kind of hypotheticals on this particular last one. 1,006 on my total payment. What is my cash on cash returns for Mr. Jason Witherspoon? Oh, I'm working as quick as I can here. All right. Five years. I'm getting quicker at pushing buttons here. <laughs> she got a 581. I'm running the math at the same time. Let's try it. Any answers from out there in the Facebook or YouTube world? What is my what does my cash on cash returns look like for this unit? It's not good. My apologies there, back office. <laughs> Going once. Oh, I'm still working here. Going twice, 581 times 12. 57%. I got that 60. There we go. <coughs> Uh, Is that better? My, my memory serves right, yes. <coughs> Divided by, and I'm all in at 12. So, hey, with, oh, with 3,000, with, with, uh, with 5,000 down, so my exposed, so let me see here. I was trying not to cough the whole time I was doing this. I didn't want to blow everybody's 57% would have been right if we was 12,000 in, but it's we got 5,000 down, so we're 7,000 in for a total of 99.6% cash on cash. So Sohail, yes, very close, but you ran your math off of 12 grand. If we ran our math off of seven grand because we got the 5,000 down, the cash on cash would look right at 100%. Jason, Jeremiah says use your fingers. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what that means. It works. Oh. I think that's a little complicated here. Well, I knew it was less than 1%. I was trying not to cough that whole time. I'm like, don't cough, don't cough <laughs> into the mic. Um, so are you seeing how I run the numbers here? Yeah, and what we're seeing here is a gradual decline as his price goes up. Mm -hmm. he, you're seeing your cash on cash returns dip below the 100% mark. So this is kind of where you need to pull your own levers. What is the minimum returns that you're gonna look for? And then kind of reverse this back and figure out where you need to be. Like, if you're willing to pay 15,000 for a unit, you can easily, all day long, go out and buy mobile homes. $15,000, you can buy mobile homes all day long at fifteen grand. 
Well, I saw one, and, and, and so the, this is something we got to touch on because we see these traded on Facebook. We see them pushed out by wholesalers. God will, God bless them. I saw one go out this week. They wanted eight or nine thousand for it. They had, it had been burned down the backside. It had a roof missing and stuff. No. You see, you see craziness happen. I saw one come across for seven grand. That was uh, somebody was trying to help me out. It had um, the lifted ends at both ends, so it was you know like two. Uh, yeah. So we're talking seventies. Yeah. Seven thousand bucks. We know that that's not. It's not going to work. That's a two thousand dollar trailer in its best day. Yeah. Um, and, and it might be worth it on the right situation. If it's on a lot on land, that's a different deal. Exactly. So, it's. As much as I would like to be able to sit here and do a three-part series with you and teach you everything there is to know about mobile homes, I am teaching you everything I can possibly teach you, but there's going to be situational differences that you're just going to have to pull into your own gray matter sure. and come up with your own solutions for. But overall, I am giving you all of the knowledge you need to be educated enough to go out and form your own decisions. What do we got going on over there? Time? No, Tyler. Tyler. Oh, that, how was I supposed to figure that out? So, Hi. hey, Tyla, how are you doing, baby bear? And Tyla's my little daughter. Uh, she's about two and a half years old now, but she loves, she loves watching Daddy on TV. She sees Facebook, and she thinks it's TV, and she loves seeing Daddy on TV. So I love it when she gets to tune in and watch. So, hi, Tyla. How are you doing out there? So moving forward, do we have any questions on these slides so far, or are we doing good? I want to say that Tyla's the only person that ever gives me the same dirty looks Daniel gives me. <laughs> she always gives me these looks that scare me a little bit. She's got really good ones. She, and, she, and I'm she showing learned, you the picture of my daughter. She gives me the same look. Does she? Yeah, it's just, I'm like. She's, okay. got, my, she's got daddy's eyes down. What's got up? A, you got a couple questions. Okay. Uh, do you use a service company to send payment for a lot rent or do it yourself? Ooh, good uh, do you use an RMLO to qualify the buyer? Excellent questions. I'm going to tell you what I do, not what I suggest you do. Okay, so. Let me deal with part one. Do I use a note servicer to collect it and distribute funds? No, it costs 15 to 20 bucks a month. Neither myself nor my buyer wants to pay that. I collect it and I pay the, I pay the lot rent. I personally, whenever I structured these transactions, I put all of the lot rent for all of my units on auto pay. So that way I knew every single month they were getting paid whether I got paid or not. Because if you stop paying the landlord, because now you're, you're talking about lot rent, that's dealing with the landlord. If I stop paying lot rent, um, my unit can have some difficulties. So I always wanna make sure that my park manager's getting paid and never getting paid late because park managers are my relationships. If I've got a park manager that likes working with me and they find out that there's a new unit coming available, they might call me up and be like, hey man, there's a unit available. But if I've paid them late on every single month for the last six months, they're not gonna wanna do any more business with me. So I always put my park manager on auto pay and I collect all of it from my, from my, my buyer and then I distribute funds myself. Part two of that is do I use an RMLO to run the transaction? My answer is gonna be I should but I did not. Did you use anything like Appfolio to manage these transactions? No, at that time I was a relatively new in my investing career and long story short, that would have made things easier for me, but I did not. Yes, there are systems out there to help you out and, with that kind of stuff. And that stuff. system's not for somebody with 10, I think you have to have 30 properties to get mm -hmm. into that deal, but once you get to a certain level, 30 bucks a month, they process stuff for you, do a lot of things. So that would have definitely helped me out. Uh, so Hale is asking, is 6% typical to charge or do you charge more? For me, it was, in my opinion, levers. No matter what, I wanted to get what I wanted out of it. So if somebody was balking at the purchase price, my interest would go up. If somebody's balking at the interest, my purchase price would go up. It's like, you, you, you just, how much your down payment is, how much do you want, oh, like if I say it's 10% interest, they're like, oh, I'm not gonna pay 10% interest. I'm like, all right, I'll give it to you at 7%, but I'm gonna sell it to you for 27 grand instead of 25 grand. It, I get my money at the end of the day, no matter what. It's just overall, um, you know, what are, they, what are they upset about? Is it the, um, is it the interest they're upset about? Is it the purchase price they're upset about? Is it the monthly payment they're upset about? If they don't want to pay 900 a month in payments, but they give me a good down payment, I'll give them a six-year loan instead of a five-year loan. I'll give them a seven-year loan instead of a five-year loan. And a lot of these levers Daniel's talking about moving, this is, I mean, you're kind of like the man behind the curtain here, right? That, that number doesn't change. That total payment doesn't change when you're flipping these levers almost all the time. It changes by 10, 20, 50 bucks. Yep. 
almost every one of these folks that needs this type of opportunity is going to be a payment buyer. Mm -hmm. And if they come up to me and I've got this unit, it's 1006 a month, and they're like, I cannot afford more than 900 a month. Well, let's take a look at our financial calculator. So they can only afford 900 a month. So there's four numbers up at the top, the number of payments, the interest rate, the present value, and the payment. Well, if they can only afford a $900 a month payment, well, 581 per month, I can't affect the lot rent. I can't do anything about the lot rent. I can't control that, but I can control the, the, the payment, 581. So if they need 900 a month in payments, I need to drop about 100 bucks a month off of my payment. So if I put in, let's say, 481, and I put that into the payment field, I then click on present value and that change that changes the present value of my note. So now I know that I need to sell my unit for more than what I was selling it for because my payment dropped. So I just use those different inputs to change and if they want a $900 a month payment, I'll still make just as much money. I'll just either change the interest or the PV or the term length. That's how I figure it out. So I just did what you did. I've typed in negative 481 there for the payment and hit it and it changed it to a nine year note automatically. See, boom. There's, uh, there's other ways to do that. You might not want to go nine years. So you leave it at seven, adjust your interest adjust rate. Adjust your interest. So it's all those four numbers. You get what you want out of that deal. And if they're coming to you like, I cannot afford more than 900 a month, but I got 5,000 down and I want this unit. It's your unit. You're just gonna have to pay on it for another year. Sure. Another two years. What's up? A couple more questions I'll let you get going. Um, so Hale, just to make sure he understands, the way to determine the price would be to calculate the monthly payment you can get and then multiply the amount by five years, including the expected annual rate? Pretty much, pretty much that. So let's say I've got a 1970s trailer box that's in horrible condition. And the math on that particular formula tells me that I'm going to turn around and sell it for 33000 not because I have empirical data to, to, to support this, but I just know that whenever I put that out to the market, the market's going to reject that purchase price. But I know that my monthly payments can be five to 600 bucks a month, but instead of selling it for five years, I might sell it for two years, where the total payoff on it is 16,000. Somebody might be willing to pay 16,000 for that 1970s box. But if I get a, a good looking 1980s, 1990s, I'll still have the exact same payment, but I'll, I'll lengthen that loan term out to six years and turn around and sell it for 40 grand versus 15 or 16 grand. Because although the end buyer, and that kind of goes back to that scenario I was telling you about with the 1989 Honda Civic, somebody might be willing to pay five grand for a 1989 Honda Civic if they can afford the payment, but they're not going to be willing to pay 25 grand even if the payment's the same. They're just going to look at it and they're like, I'm not paying 25 grand right. for that Honda Civic. I don't care what the payment is. So you kind of got to use the market to tell you what that is. Use a little bit of your own uh, intuition to determine what that is. But overall, that is how I determine the price. Let's do one more questions and then we'll save the rest of the questions for the end of the show. Okay. That way we can maintain this as a three-parter versus <laughs> a four or five. Uh, Sonia in Phoenix, uh, first of all, she wants to say her challenge is two in the Phoenix area, but follow up. How much time a week would you put into this to getting homes on average? I'm gonna have to say, you're gonna have to commit at least, eight to 12 hours a week, I would say is a concerted effort uh, to achieving your goal. Uh, if you're only looking to do two, you might, you might be able to do eight to 12 hours a month. Like you probably only need to do one, you know, an hour or two a day dropping Craigslist ads, following up on Craigslist ads, uh, one day a week uh, driving for dollars in mobile home parks. That should bring enough leads in to generate the amount of deals you're looking to do, which two deals should be very accomplishable. Um, you know, Craigslist ads, some bandit signs, driving for dollars will generate the leads that you need. Once you've got the leads, it's not much further past that to get the deal done. Can, can I weigh on in, the, in on that for Sonia? Um, Sonny, that's snowbird country. I've lived out there. I don't know Phoenix as good as Tucson, but there's a thousand retirees within driving distance of you that are looking for that opportunity. Um, there's uh, a thousand single moms or, or somebody else that needs it. I guarantee you there's a part of your town that you can find this in right now by driving there this afternoon. So 
I know there's, I personally have not invested in Phoenix, but one of the people that I origi- uh, networked with a lot in the beginning was a Phoenix right. investor, and he was doing the exact same thing I was at the exact same time. And Me and him were bouncing ideas off each other all the time. Those properties, and when you're talking snowbird country, and for people that don't know, you're talking about all the northerners that come down and spend the winter in, in the, essentially, all the way from the valley in Texas all the way to Yuma, Arizona. Um, Yuma, Arizona's population doubles in, in, the, in the winter, or triples. This is all retirees that come down to stay warm for the winter, and the, those parks will be empty all year, and all of a sudden they just slam out with people. So, but, there you go. That's a good place for you to look, things to think about in your own market, but overall, that's, that's your business. If you, if you invest eight to 12 hours a week into this, you should be able to pull off at least one mobile home a month doing that kind of effort. So that's really good for you that are still out there working. Moving forward. Sample purchase agreements. Give me a second to see if I can pull some up here on my computer. Don't move over to my computer just yet. Let me see if I can pull through here. But this, the purchase agreements for these things can be pretty simple. The one that I have is a copyrighted one, and I don't want to share that publicly because it is copyrighted. But let me take a look through it real fast, and I'll, I'll give you some of the key points as well as some other takeaways that you can look at from here. So- so while Daniel's pulling it up, just I don't know if y'all caught that math. He said he, how many notes have you done total on these? Between 30 to 40. 30 to 40. He took 12 to retiring, essentially. Get him out of the rat race. Obviously, Daniel's not retired. He just told you if you do 8 to 10 hours a week or 8 to 12 hours a week, you do one a month. Do you have eight, 8 hours a week for the rest of this next year coming up to uh, get yourself out of the rat race? I love the way you put that because, I mean, that is exactly the power behind this. So for anybody that's out there that wants to create true passive income, I don't consider single family rentals to be true passive income, um, then this is the way to do it. I don't see a better way to do that and be in real estate. That, that well, if we kept, keep having kids, it won't. But it, we, right now, that $6,000 a month he threw out earlier for those 12, those 12 uh, notes that he created would be enough to get me and my wife out of the rat race. And that in itself, is a kind of freedom you can it allows you to grow exponentially it really does um, because if you if you if you if you maintain um, discipline and you take the income that's being generated from your notes and you stockpile that up and let's say starting out all you got is that five grand well if you got that five grand and then you turn around and turn it into five hundred dollars a month in income in ten months you can buy another unit but the difference is, is that first unit that you, you, you created a note on is going to pay you for five years. But in 10 months, you got all that money back and you go out and buy another one. And that's, what I, that's the way I did this in that class that we did here on Propelio TV six, seven months ago, where I was talking about the power of using mobile homes to retire yourself, is if you take all of the income coming back in from the notes generated and you compound that and put it back into buying more mobile homes, now I'm making 1000 a month. Now it only takes me five months to save up enough money to go out and buy another one. And then it only takes me two months to save up enough money to buy another one. And then it only takes me one month to buy another one. And then it only takes me one month to buy two more. And then it only takes me one month to buy three more. You're getting the point, like all that income as it comes in, it's just like, boom. And if 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 you work the plan and you plan the work, it pays off. I just dropped that link in the both comments. Okay, so there you go. So I'm gonna throw this challenge out to everybody. I'll do this with y'all. I'm gonna figure this out. January starting out. Next next December, we can circle these wagons and come back and look and see which ones are, are full of it or with it. <laughs> I mean, it's all. So reach out to cheap. Jason on there. Talks cheap. Reach out to Jason. I know that you're gonna go out there and put some work behind this. So let's see. Well, what we it's can talks do. cheap for me Randy too. Just said, if we keep having kids, we won't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I got I got this oh, purchase agreement for me. I don't want to show my screen. Uh, I do not want to show my screen, but I'll go through the basics of what's in this purchase agreement so you know what needs to be there. It is a single page document. It is not much more than that, but I need to have the date on it and basically say that I'm agreeing to buy the make, year make and model, and what the serial number of that unit is, the location of it. So if you're out there and you need to write this down, remember this is recorded if you need to go back and rewind. What's the year make and model, serial number of the unit, where is it located? What is the total sales price? How much of a deposit did I put down? Any additional payments that are owed? When is it owed by? And the date that I'll take possession of it. 
in any of the contents of the home that I am planning to buy with it? Like, am I buying the refrigerator? Am I buying the, the freezer? Is there anything else in the home that's supposed to be transferred with it? And then, um, this is a single page document. It's literally like three, three, three paragraphs, but I don't want to share it because it is copyrighted. Um, but, but we can get one and put it out there for everybody. Yeah, it's we'll get one and put it out there. Uh, it's essentially saying that, that when they turn it over to me, it's going to be free and clear of all liens, encumbrances, and that they're not going to leave it trash. They're going to get it out of there and clean, and that they certify to me that the park rent is current, and that there is nothing in that home that they don't own, such as, let's say there's a stove in there, and I think it's going to be my stove, and whenever I buy it, I find out that it's a rent-to-own stove, sure. and somebody comes in and kicks in my door and takes my stove. That, that, that is essentially all that this says. It's like three and a half paragraphs, and you're done. So... I know there's more to it than that. I'll try and source a mobile home uh, a purchase agreement that we can put into this class. But that overall is the basics of the purchase agreement, not a difficult transaction. Now, whenever I turn around and sell it, far more complicated. Far more complicated on selling it because I am financing it. I do have uh, laws that I have to abide by in Texas selling mobile homes, especially as a retailer. Uh, I have a lot of paperwork that I have to put into place to sell one of these, and we'll go through all of that as we move forward as well. Hmm. So let me go back to here. Settlement procedures whenever I'm purchasing one of these units. I need to execute the purchase agreement. If I'm in Texas, if you're not in Texas, you're needing to figure out your own process, but I need to fill out an application for statement of ownership and location. You can find that document at TDHCA if you go to my computer and I come over here, Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. If you see down here, scroll down, I've got, where is it at right here? Recording ownership and titling here on the left-hand side. I click on that. In previous class, we talked about researching manufactured home ownership records. That's how you look for liens. But right down here, you see this little button that says application for statement of ownership. I can click on that. And this is what it's going to look like here in the state of Texas. I'm going to scroll in on this so you can see it. Very simple document but I'm gonna fill this out and I'll spend two and a half seconds going through this with you. Personal property transaction, all of my transactions will be. It's gonna be a used mobile home. It's not gonna be real property, so I don't deal with that. I typically uh, expedite. So right there, type of handling, do I want normal 15 working days or do I want an expedited? Expedited is an extra 55 bucks, non-expedited is only 55. I pay the 110 bucks and get it done fast. I keep on going. Manufacturer's name, address, city, state, license number. You find that on the on the label, or excuse me, on the data plate in the closet, or through researching the uh, serial number, model. You'll find all of this information that's located in this section, such as the section length, width, width, serial number. Fill all that in. Does home have a HUD label or Texas seal? If it does, yes. If it does not, click no. And if it is not, you got to tell them which one's missing and include an additional. $35 to replace it. They'll send you a new one. I'll come down. The physical location of where this, prop, where this property is located. Was home moved for the sale? If it was, click yes. If not, click no. If it was, you better have a permit. Otherwise, you're going to have some problems. Was home installed for the sale? Yes or no? If no, most all of my transactions, not even most, all of my transactions stayed put. I did not move them. So that is good information for you to have. If you moved it, you're gonna to need to put the installer's name right there. This, the rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. The name of the sellers, their information. The name of the buyers, their information. Is this transaction a sale, yes or no? The reason they ask you that is because this same document can be used for a foreclosure. Uh, date of sale, transfer, or ownership change. All simple stuff to figure out. Uh, right of survivorship, um, married couple, joint owners. You figure that out on your own. Section six. If you are converting this to real property, you need to deal with this part right here. Block seven, to designate a home as business use, non-residential or salvage. Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs basically says that for a home to be sold as a home, it needs to meet certain criteria. It needs to be, how do I say that? livable, no holes in the walls, needs to have heating and air conditioning, needs to have a roof, it needs to have those types of things. And if it doesn't have those things, you are not allowed to sell it as a home. 
uh, especially if you're a retailer or a broker, not allowed to sell it as a home. So if there, it was a home in the past and it has some serious issues with it, you can convert it over to business use. And this right here is how you would do it. But you can never sell a home that has been designated as business use for a private residence. You will get yourself in massive, I don't even know how to say it other than massive amounts of trouble. If you have a business use mobile home and you sell it as a private residence, especially if you're an RBI, if you're RBI retailer, broker, installer, that's what you call them in Texas. That's the brokers in Texas. If you do this, you will be in a massive is amount it, of trouble. Is it because they're held to a different standard on what they build that building for? Yep. Uh, no. Um, let's say I have, let's say I have a mobile home, and it, whenever a mobile home is installed or in, uh, done, it's supposed to be inspected by the state. When the state inspects it, if there's a hole the size of a basketball in the roof, they're going to say this home cannot be sold as a private residence. This is not meet a resident standards. It needs to be no water penetrating the unit it needs to be installed properly it doesn't need to have holes in the wall it doesn't need to have holes in the floor it needs to have heating air conditioning and water if it doesn't meet those san sanitary conditions it cannot be used as a personal ref or residence according to texas now, i don't know about the rest of your state it's the tdhca right that's texas department of housing and community affairs and they'll say this is a business use you're not allowed to use it for anything other than business use if i'm told it is business use and then I still knowingly turn around and sell it to someone mm. that's going to use it as a private residence, whether or not it says in my agreement that it, it's business use only, but you and I both know that you're going to move into this thing. It's not going to cut it. You will lose your butt doing that. Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs gets a complaint on that. Not only will they likely come in and force you to buy them a brand new home, you'll probably be forced to pay them back everything that they've paid you. Right. Do not do it. Just do not do it. Is it uh, on the arrears and stuff? Is it a multiplication of the arrears? Have no clue right. who, why you get fined, but I do remember very clearly from my class, TDHCA did not play around about that at all. So liens, this right here on a purchase, there should be no liens. All right, so we got section right here, block 8A, this is liens. If I'm buying it, I don't want any liens filled out here. So there'll be, I'll check no, and I'd leave this section blank. But if I'm selling it and I know that there's going to be a lien, then I'll go ahead and click yes. And I would put my name in here as a lien holder, all of my information as the lien holder, and then a special mailing instructions for a copy of the SOL once it's been filed. If I am buying this and or selling it, I always put into block nine my information so that way whenever the SOL is filed, I know that it's been completed whenever I receive the documentation back, come down, get everything signed off on notarization is not required but suggested that's all it takes to put together and file for your for your um, application of statement of ownership and location all right so going back to the slides what's important to talk to the manager i, I know you're fixing to get to this but what exactly and why is it important to talk to you? so i've talked about that in section one and section two but to re to rehash that the park manager owns the real estate that my personal property sits on. Let that sink in for a second. They own the real estate that my personal property sits on. And if they own that real estate, they kind of put forth the rules that I must abide by. And if they have rules and or opinions that disagree with my business practice, they can really quickly make my day a pain in the ass, just bad as bad can be. They can A, tell me, get my mobile home and get it out of their park. And if I wasn't planning on moving it and I didn't have that included into my budget, that could be a bad day. Uh, they might come up and tell me, well, there's eight months behind in park and lot rent. You need to pay me that. That's something I'd like to know. Uh, they might inform me of rules that I was not aware of, such as they are no longer allowing homes in their community. They're built before 1998. And if mine's a 1995, what do I do? So there's a lot of questions that you're going to want to ask that park manager, which we went over in part one and part two. But overall, the park manager, you're going to need to find out from them, will they allow you to purchase this mobile home, bring it to the park standards, and sell it to a new owner, transfer title, and hold a lien against that property? If they'll allow me to do that, and everything else meets my standards, then I'll do business in that park. So the reason I'm asking this, and I don't want to diverge here, is there's probably a couple of reasons this could or couldn't go wrong. What are the triggers that could, that, so after you buy it, I'm sure that's the trigger of the ownership change. 
is, is what the trigger is. But if you owner finances to somebody, everybody's in agreement, everything's caught up, what would be a type of trigger that could create a problem for you after you already have this note going? Crazy park manager. Okay, crazy park manager. Can he just say you got to get out of here at any point? You mentioned a key word earlier, and that was an agreement. If that was a verbal agreement, it's now my word against theirs. Uh, if it's a written agreement, it's a lot more easy to defend, but it will have to be defended. Um, there's a lot to think about down that line because that park manager almost becomes a partner in your business. So making sure that that park manager is not only okay with you doing it, but they are resoundingly okay with you doing it. I'll ask them five different ways the same question, and not only will I ask them five different ways the same question, I'll ask them is their answer the final answer, is there somebody that works above them that might be able to tell them no, you are wrong. Because if the park manager does not like what you're doing, your day's done. And so when, the reason I'm asking this is because we both know that there's a park manager out there that's, I'm just guessing, going to come to you one day and be like, man, my kid would really like a PlayStation 4 for Christmas. I guarantee you that stuff happens. Well, if you've got a lease agreement in place that's written, then they can't do that. But if the lease agreement's for a year, at the end of the year, that lease gets renewed then I might find out my lot rent goes up 150 bucks a month. And that's, I know this is shady to talk about, but this stuff happens. It may not happen in other parts of our business, but it is, if this stuff happens in the oil fields, it happens in these trailer parks. Mm -hmm. um, it can happen. I would not use it as a deterrent to getting into this no, business. I wouldn't either. But I would use it as a very cautionary statement. Always vet your park manager front, back, left, right. Talk to your neighbors. Find out what kind of park manager you're dealing with. And, and these people, just like, um, just like these group admins on Facebook, become a guy to their own little domain. Mm -hmm. And if you start pissing on their shoes, excuse my language, you're going to end up with a bad, a bad situation. You truly will. So it, it's just incredibly important to have that aspect of this business addressed. If, if there's a lien on file, let's say I, I look at the SOL, the Statement of Ownership and Location, and we discussed that in part two where we cert research liens. If there is a lien on file, then I need to get the lender to file Form B. This is all Texas based. If you're not in Texas, you need to figure out your own state. But file a Form B from the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Going back to my computer, it's all here, man. There is no better resource in Texas than the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs to learn about mobile home paperwork. They have videos on here. They teach you everything because they want you to do it right. But right here is a Form B. I'm not going to go through this particular document with you. It's self-explanatory. I figured it out on my own. If you're doing this business, you should probably be able to do the same. Scroll through that, and it's pretty straightforward. Get that filled out if there's a lien on file and you need it removed. Going back to the slides... If I'm unable to clear title, let's say for whatever reason, let's say there is a lien on file and that lender has gone out of business and you can no longer get access to them so you can't get the form B, then you can come back through and file or fill out an affidavit down here. Ownership aff uh, affidavit of fact for abandonment if you're looking at my computer, affidavit of fact for real property, affidavit of fact for right of survivorship ownership, and then ownership affidavit of fact. If I just click on this one right here, I need to go in here and basically say, this is the mobile home, and here's some statement of facts. The statement of facts are, I bought this property from Green Tree Financial, I paid it off, here's proof of my payments, they've gone out of business, I've tried to contact them, here's a copy of my certified mail return receipt requested, showing undeliverable, I have no way to contact them, I've tried all these phone numbers, this property's gone out of business, here's proof that they've gone out of business, uh, but I did pay this thing off. If you do all of that here, I have not, I have yet to have the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs come back to me and say, I won't release the lien. So getting the liens released is not difficult. I've gotten probably about five or six personally released myself, but I did spend probably two to three weeks on each one trying to get it done. Is this easier because we're dealing with personal property versus real property? I'd say yeah. I'd say yeah. I'm, my experience says it's nowhere, it just has its own ways. Right. And what I just showed you is how I did it. So 
I don't, I don't ever like getting up here and just pretending like I know everything, but this is how I did it. And it was much, it was easy for me. And I researched all of this on my own. So it's not like I went to a class and I learned how to do this. I spent six, seven, eight hours just scouring the internet, trying to figure this out. And through my due diligence, I figured these things out. And that is what I'm sitting here teaching you. So like I've told you in the past, I've got close to $10,000 in mobile home, mobile home investing education purchased and put into my mind. But even through $10,000 worth of mobile home investing education, when I go to Texas, Texas has its own laws, its own things. I had to learn Texas laws. I had to learn how to do things in Texas. So I am teaching you the things that I learned on my own in my, in my, in my office sitting there on my computer. And this goes back to Daniel's favorite mentor, which is Google. Google. Like, stop, I mean, take a minute to Google your question. Mm -hmm. Like, literally just type in the question in Google. A lot it, of times it'll come up. It will, and one of the things with Google is the internet has a whole bunch of facts. Nothing on the internet is, 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 is lies. So if you take that into consideration and you think every time that you find something that you found the answer, you need to find that answer multiple of times and from multiple of sources and try and determine what the credibility of that source is because just because I find the answer on Google doesn't mean that it's the right answer. And I am like cotton mouth over here, so I'm gonna get me a piece of gum. Excuse me. Um, no, I got the jitters bad already, so I don't think. Water. Yeah, water would be awesome. Last time y'all did that to me, I could barely sit here. For the rest <laughs> of the show. So, Seven slides. so going back to the class, if we need a break, somebody out there on YouTube or Facebook, if y'all need a break, scream at me. Let me know. I'm gonna keep going. But if we're unable to clear title, we can do the SOL affidavit of fact. If it's an abandoned property, same same location here on the internet. If I go back to my computer. Right here, affidavit of fact for abandonment. There are detailed instructions for how to do that. Go through here, see like right here up here, it says notice of intent to acquire abandoned manufactured home. That right there, good resource. Learn about it, read it. I'm not gonna teach you it because text department will do a better job than I will and it's all right there for you. I'm putting you in the right direction. Go study this. And don't text Daniel in his DMs and ask him to interpret it. Read it first before you ask the question. Read it many a times. Call the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs. Ask them how to do it. Trying because, to help you out because I know that's what's yeah. going to happen. My DM stays so full. <laughs> I, for those that are watching, that are that are still watching, I haven't been on Facebook really in about a month. I, I'm just tired of it. I'm tired of the drama. I'm tired of all of the BS back and forth. I'm tired of. I'm just tired of it. It's just like boring. I'm, I'm moving on. Talk to park manager to confirm understanding. I've got that on here twice. I've got that on here twice. So much so because. It is that important to make sure that you do it. This last piece was a bit of a struggle for me, and that is your tax office 18-month tax statement. Before I can file and get my statement of ownership and location, I must go to my taxing authority, uh, whoever your tax assessor is, in Texas. Once again, if you're, if you're in Texas, this all applies. If you're not in Texas, this may or may not apply. Find out what your rules are in your own state. But in Texas, I have to go to the taxing authority and uh, get an 18 month tax statement. The problem I found with most of the taxing authorities here in Texas, if we go back to the slides, is the problem with this is that 18 month tax statement, Thank almost you. nobody at the county offices knew what it was. And then if, we, if we're thinking about this, here in Texas there's probably, not Texas, but here in DFW, there's probably about 9, 10, 11, 12 taxing offices and out of 9, 10, 11, 12 taxing offices, there's only one that would allow you to get this tax statement. So I had to find the one tax, that taxing authority that knew what it was. And literally, when I showed up to the counter, it was like, hey, Susie, I'm trying to get an 18 month tax statement. Susie just looks at me with like that, that government worker blank stare of like, I know you want help from me, but I have no desire to help you because I get paid whether I help you or not. And I'm like, 18 month tax statement. And they're like, no, we don't do those. And I'm like, I just drove an hour to get here because I talked to someone and they said, you do them, we don't do them. And I'm like, no, you do them. No, we don't. I'm like, you do them. Well, let me go ask somebody. Like 20 minutes later of chit chat back and forth, they pull like some blue haired old lady out of the back office. It's like, she did one of these three years ago. She knows what she's doing. And she'll come over there and give you the tax statement. You have to get it. And the, the, the tax assessor will just flat out tell you, we don't do them. We don't know what you're talking about. You just have to keep asking, keep asking, keep asking. I, I cannot believe how many times I've ran into this problem of showing up to the tax office to get this and they won't do it because they don't know what they're doing. 
You just have to tell them, I know you don't know what you're doing, but it's your job to do it. Figure it out. This is the county assessor's office, not the TDHCA. And this is not TDHCA. This is, this is the local uh, county tax assessor. You show up, 18-month tax statement. Once you've got that, you can continue moving forward. And in, in Texas, I don't know about everywhere else, the appraisal district who sets the price of what those taxes are is different from the tax assessor's office. Good point. Go to the tax assessor's office. Tax assessor office all day, all, every day. Pay the seller, send your 18-month tax statement, application for SOL, and all other necessary docs to TDHCA with payment. You've purchased your mobile home. You don't have to have a title company involved. You can do this on the hood of a car. Overall, to get your tax statement and everything else, you could probably get it done in a day. Transaction, clean cut, easy to do. So, let's, um, aside from, I just want to pick this apart real quick. The only thing you need to do with the person selling you that is the execute the purchase agreement. They'll need to sign several of them other documents that are there if they're needed. Uh, they'll definitely have to f uh, sign the app, app, app for the SOL. Um, beyond that... So, so I guess what I'm asking is on the appointment, just to make sure where we're going here. When you go out, do you say, okay, let's get a purchase agreement. Then as soon as you get that purchase agreement, you go do all the other paperwork, or do you show up with all the paperwork? Uh, I show up all with all the paperwork, except for the tax statement and stuff like that. But like, if I'm on the phone with them, uh, I'll probably do a little bit of my due diligence over the phone. I'll look up the title. I'll see if there's liens against it. Probably while I'm right there on the phone with them. And I'll be like, hey, I'm seeing a lien there. And they're like, oh, no, there's no lien. Blah, blah. Just figure it out. You show up. Uh, if you don't have this with you, you can quickly run back to the office, print it off, fill it out. Simple transaction, closing it out in an eight-hour workday, pretty Easy. simple to do. Pretty simple to do. I've, I've done many of them in an eight-hour day. Unless you end up having to file Form Bs and get liens cleared, two to three weeks is about what I was having to do to get a lien cleared. So it's all good there. So that's how I buy it. So now let's figure out how to sell it. What are we going to do with our buyers? We've discussed that a lot here in Section 1, 2, and we're going to discuss it a little bit here, but since we have discussed it so much, I'm not going to spend too much time on here because I do want to get into the closing of the transaction because I think that's where most of this is going to benefit people is how to secure, the, secure it, set up the prom notes, and everything else in between. So my buyers, one of the key benefits to this is they're going to have the opportunity for home ownership. Are you following me there? Nope. These people, I remember the very first transaction, and I've discussed this more than once. I sat down with an older gentleman, probably in his late 50s, early 60s, and he was buying this mobile home, and he was in tears at the day that, well, at the point in time we closed this. Now, he was in his late 50s, early 60s, but he did have about a 10 to 11 year old son. And I remember him sitting there at that table with his son in tears, giving his son a hug, saying, we own a home. Because never in his life had he ever owned a home, and never in his life did he think he was going to get to own a home. And it was overwhelming for him to feel the pride of ownership in owning that home. So there's definitely a big benefit to your buyers feeling connected to that property and their opportunity to own something, especially when they never thought they could. Going forward from there, it is an affordable payment. That is the key thing behind this type of investing strategy is it's safe, clean, affordable housing. That is what we're trying to do, and we're trying to keep it affordable. That's why when I was talking about the repairs, that's why we did the repairs we did. Used appliances, Formica countertops, plastic sinks, really cheap light fixtures, because we're trying to stick with that affordable piece. But it's affordable housing. And, and like you mentioned, these are like Lego sets in some ways. Mm -hmm. You can plug and play. I, feel, I don't want to, I don't know. I, I looked up a mobile home, mobile home um, supplier mm -hmm. here in Fort Worth that I didn't know existed after we had this talk. There's one right there off Red Oak on 35 and another one over there in Hearst. And uh, I found one in Fort Worth, so I don't know where that one is. But um, you can go get these five different styles of sinks that he that Daniel mm -hmm. was talking about. So these are plug and play mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And the sinks are like 12 bucks. It's so like you, a plastic, it's like a form molded. It's like, it's like a Coke bottle for a sink, literally. It's like, it's like a Coke bottle sink. I, I want to, so I, I bring this up all the time, but I want to talk about the buyer. One thing, in Johnson County, Texas, where I live, I used to could walk around and kick $20,000 houses all day. Mm -hmm. I could literally just walk down the street and kick them. There's nothing on the market down there that's not falling over for 60000 or less. It just doesn't exist anymore. We've had a huge market shift here, new people moving to Texas. It's created a ripple effect into mm -hmm. the rural communities. The guy that I see, he still works there from when I was a kid that was loading feed at the feed store. Same old dude. I promise you he's never making more than minimum wage. 
He can't afford a house in Cleveland, Texas anymore. This is the guy that needs a safe, affordable, clean place to live. It's close to his work. And this right here gives him the opportunity to do it. So don't judge the investors for doing this and don't judge the buyers for being in the situation they're in. There's a market for it and we're serving it. So looking at this, an additional benefit is you can get better school districts. That's one of the scenarios I was telling you about where it's $1,000 a month payment. People are like, who's gonna pay a thousand bucks a month for a mobile home? School district, 110% the reason for that one. Uh, and this being a very big one here is for people on fixed incomes. They've only got so much money a month and they know they're gonna have to be a little tight for the next three to five years to pay off this mobile home. But once it's paid off, they get a 30 to 40% pay raise because that's the only way they can get it is to reduce their expenses because they're on fixed social security, Medicaid, Medicare, retirement, whatever that ends up being, they need every dollar that they can get. And by doing this, they are able to bring in the reduced monthly income they need to live a better life in right. a place that's safe, clean, and affordable. And first time home buyers is another one. So that's kind of the buyers that I'm looking for. Marketing this property for sale. I'm gonna talk to the neighbors in the park and, that, and tell them I've got a referral program. People wanna live around people they know and love. So you start telling all the neighbors around, hey, I'm gonna sell this thing, I need 5,000 down. If you know of anybody, boom, they're gonna be like, I got a cousin, uncle, friend, best friend, blah, blah, blah. blah. They want their friends living next door. They're good pro opportunities for you, especially when they see if you did a good job to it, they're gonna want their friends living there. Door hangers at nearby apartments or bulletin boards, bulletin, bulletin, whatever. Um, online and paper classifieds. I sold a lot on Craigslist. Nowadays, I probably use Facebook Marketplace. I haven't invested in mobile homes in probably about four years. Bandit signs, they work, they work, they work. Most, if not all of my homes sold were off of bandit signs. Most, if not all of my buyers I found we're on Craigslist. There's a difference between buyers and selling the home. I'd always get a ton of people calling me up on Craigslist and I'd add them to a buyer sheet of people saying, I got this much down and I'm looking for this type of home in this area. But almost always I sold it off a of bandit sign. So I don't, I just, I'm laughing. I don't want to give away the juice of this because it's Corey's deal, but we put together a, I had a lead. We went out and put together a mobile home park the other day mm -hmm. and the dude that sold it to us, 72. He does all his own marketing on Facebook for every one of his rentals. And he's <laughs> trying to tell us how powerful it is. <laughs> That's he's awesome. Like, he's like, it is the most powerful thing. You can do this. It's free. <laughs> and then we're both just sitting there like, oh, that's really good news, sir. Like, <laughs> I love that, man. I love it when I find people like that. Um, when I'm marketing for sale, I need to make sure that I convey to them that I have flexible turns and owner financing. And... Pay very good attention to this. I need you to go out and do your own due diligence and research. Not a lawyer, but you can get yourself in some trouble here. Pay attention to triggering TILA Reg Z. TILA is short for Truth and Lending Act. Mm -hmm. Regulation Z. That is a very clearly defined law that states whenever I'm advertising something for sale and I mentioned terms, interest rate, down payment, any of these things, any of these triggering terms, that if I include one, I must include all the rest of them. And a lot of people break that law, but the, they do crack down on that. They'll have ghost buyers calling up and be like, hey, I saw that you're owner financing this. How much is my payment gonna be? How much is this? How much is that? How much is this? And they'll try and bait you into that. So no Tilla Reg Z, know it. So it's okay to say stuff like low down payment. Low down payments, okay. But you can't say thousand down, hundred bucks a month, or you know, 500 down, 800 a month. You can't do that. So what was the interest rate? Yeah, I got you. I'm not going to say yeah. I've never made this mistake, but luckily I texted somebody here on the Propelio staff and they <laughs> told me to make those advertising disappear. Uh, Tiller Reg Z is something you need to spend your own time studying, but yes. it will keep your, keep your little button in the, right, in the right side of the water. And I had no idea what that was. I was just doing, which can yeah. get you in trouble sometimes. Just doing can get you a long ways, and I try to never discourage somebody from just doing because there are, there's a book out there, and I, re I make reference to it a lot all the time. It's like a felony a day is what the book's called or something like that. But it's written by an ex-FBI agent that basically says there are enough laws on the books sure. that you commit at least, the average person commits at least one felony a day just because there are that many laws, they're just not enforced or they're not being enforced. But he flat out said that as an FBI agent, three felonies a day, felonies. Oh, the book's called three felonies a day. But he's, he's like flat out, he's like, if I want to arrest somebody, I can, because there are just that many laws. I just gotta find the one that fits and arrest them. Well, there, there you go. Sunday when you're sitting on the front row at church, you think about that <laughs> and know that all these folks around you are felons. <laughs> so moving forward, qualifying the buyer. 
Uh, they're going to need to fill out an application, something along like a residence application. I'm going to put in there like, um, I don't have a copy. Let me give me a second, two seconds to see if I've got that here. I don't want this class to go on too long. How much? How many more slides do I have? Five. Four. Four. I should be able to get through Killer. this. Give me, give me two seconds. Part five and six. Come no. <laughs> Purchase memo. I don't think anybody can see that Compliance much review checklist, much. consumer disclosures, That's dispute resolutions, uh, site preparation, note agreement, purchase application with financing. Let's see here. Let me see if this one looks good We're for me. We need a, a stage band if we go much longer on this deal. Give me a couple seconds just to look through my documents. I've got a lot of documents in my folder here. So while he's doing that, I want to go back. I, I want it. So had a deal this week, fell apart. Not in a bad way, had some crazy tenants. They got the city involved, the house got posted, two days away from selling it. Okay. I was expecting a check last Monday. City got involved, I went down there, talked to everybody. I said, I want every part and player here. Went in very nice and did stuff and said, please come and give us your opinion on this so we can all move forward quickly. What I didn't do was go pee in their Cheerios. <laughs> and that's the same deal as going to these park managers. That deal is moving forward in a good way because we we embraced the sudden change to our structure with open <laughs> arms and we want to work with these awesome folks from this city that are helping us what we didn't do was go start a monkey knife fight <laughs> that's right? awesome and and if you go do this with these park managers i promise you they're gonna like make your life live in hell they got nothing else to do but jack with you they've got 40 hours a week to make your life a live in hell and you don't got 40 hours a week to commit to it so, so. Uh, that's the last time i bring that up but i hope everybody takes that out of this deal it, it's important so if we look, kick back over here to my computer screen, I'll zoom in on this here for a second. I'm not going to go through this whole thing. All I'm going to say is, you know, this is recorded. If you want to look at this and read it in line for line, push pause on your computer screen when you come back to watch this again. But I'm going to go through everything here. It's going to ask for their marital status, social security number, driver's license number, date of birth. I'm going to run background checks on these people. I'm going to make sure that these tenants are people that I want to do business with for five years. For five years, this person is going to be responsible for paying me 500 bucks a month. The better I do at finding out up front whether or not that person is committed to paying me, the better my next five years is going to be. So I'm going to go through here, date of birth, height, weight, eye color, hair color, applicant's current address, previous address, current employer, previous employer, other previous employers. Keep on going. Have you ever been evicted? Have you ever been asked to move out? Have you ever breached a lease agreement? Have you ever filed for bankruptcy? Have you ever lost property in a foreclosure? Had credit properties? Convicted of a crime? Sex offender? I go through and ask it all. Do you, do you follow up on that information? You better damn well do it if you enjoy being in this business. Because there's a lot of people that'll take that application and be like, all right, I, got it. I did it. But they didn't call any of those employers to see if they were stealing off the clock or got fired for that. Mm -hmm. They didn't actually check to see if they're a sex offender. They didn't pay for the background check. And if you're the person that does that, don't bitch when this deal goes south on you. You've got to do your or due diligence. Or a lawsuit happens because you yeah. let somebody move in 120 foot from a school. Yeah. That's you know, like. There's all kinds of stuff. So you just need to make sure you go out there and figure it out, man. So all of this is here. And I'll use this. I'm not giving any, you know, credibility to this document. This is just the document I use. And neither one of us are lawyers. Yeah, if you didn't figure that out yet, I am definitely not a lawyer. So going back to the slides. Can you drop a plug if anybody's listening on podcast, uh, hit us up on Facebook and let, we'll show it to them. Yeah, if anybody's out there, on, uh, uh, out there listening on the podcast, definitely go out. We are live here on Facebook as well as in the YouTube archives. Just look up the mobile home investing class and you'll have it right here. Keep All right. Can whoever's mastering these podcasts, uh, is, it, I'm not, is it still Pat? Can he drop a link to all the different places it is? Because I use Evercast to do mine. That'd be, that, that'd be a question to ask Pat. So maybe Pat could drop. Maybe Pat can drop that plug in the comments on here so that we know all the different places that people can grab these. That'd be awesome. I don't know if he actually listens to these. Well, I'm going to text him after this. So, <laughs> so credit does. check. We need to get the credit check. That's part of the application. Criminal check, that should be part of your, your, your process. Verify their employment. Call previous landlords, ask them the right questions. You always need to call all previous landlords, not just the one they're just leaving, because the one they're just leaving wants them yeah, out of that absolutely. house. So you need to call all of them. Yeah. Uh, qualify for the park. You need to make sure that that buyer goes to the park manager, sits down with the park manager. I suggest you go with them. Remember that deal I told you I lost a lot of money on and that, that park manager was, well, what they were doing is every time I'd send a buyer and they'd sell them one of their homes. 
I would go through all the problems of finding the buyer, finding the down payment. And then once I'd send them to the office, the office would say, I can't believe you're paying that much for that unit. Did you know that it had all kinds of problems and blah, 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 blah. We can get you a much better unit for that same price. Boom. I sold that home like 11 times before I finally just cut bait. I was so mad with that deal. I, I was selling, I was working on selling a property to a buyer the other day and one of the tenants was chasing me around telling me everything wrong with it. And I'm like, dude, just go away. Just, he just kept, just kept, and, and it's not, I mean, in full disclosure, I didn't mind him telling the guy. All right. I don't want to hide nothing, but it sure wouldn't make the job any easier. <laughs> so um, the last piece to it is make sure, not make sure, but consider using an RMLO. It really would make your paperwork better and leave you in a better position, but it does cost about a grand. And when you're dealing in, pr in prices that are this, this low, that RMLO price point can really jack your day up. So great benefits to doing it. Did I? No. I think you're talking about a 35-ish dollar a month charge there to have them service your note for you? No, I'm not talking about servicing the note. I'm talking about using a registered mo or a residential mortgage loan originator to go Qualify. through go through all the qualifications. My, my fault. Your debt to income stuff, your your all of the loan document package. So I made a, I jumped past that. Companies like Texas Pride will find will will actually service that note for you for a charge per month. So I didn't know they were doing loan servicing. I thought they now. were. Maybe I'm wrong. I thought they were doing it as well. I don't know. I'm not going to say they are or they're not. So I maybe just, somebody at, at the else point is. in time that I was messing around with it, they were servicing their own notes, but they were not servicing other people's notes. They may be servicing other people's notes now. Well, I'm going to drive over to Scott's office after this for something else. So, okay. So maybe I'll ask while I'm over there. Figure that one out Go for me. Go in the comments. So I do know that Grant Kemp, though, has been discussing starting a loan servicing company. So oh, okay. that might be in maybe the works. Maybe I misunderstood. So... Uh, moving forward though, settlement procedures for the sale. So we talked about settlement procedures for the purchase. Settlement procedures for sale is quite a bit different. I'm gonna qualify the buyer, that's what we were just talking about in the previous slide. I'm gonna do a compliance review checklist. Now let's go ahead and give me two seconds, I'm gonna pop back over to my computer. Um, go ahead, let's go ahead and go, go, go to my computer real quick. And I'll see if I can zoom in on this at all. Nope, that did not work. Get a Mac. <laughs> All of, this, all of these documents over here are documents that I use in the sale of a property. If you look up here at my, at my, uh, at my rabbit trails or my, my breadcrumbs, I'm in commercial properties, mobile homes, homes, selling. This is the paperwork I use for selling the home. I have different home paperwork for buying, different paperwork for selling, but all of this paperwork is paperwork I use for selling this home. But I've got a compliance review checklist Another really good resource for you uh, outside of the Texas Department of Housing and Community Affairs is the Texas Mobile Home Association. Uh, they have a lot of really good documents for you to review. But looking at this compliance review checklist, in accordance with Texas Occupation Code Chapter 1201 of the Standards Act, Texas 1201 MHSA, these are all the things that you should technically be doing when you're selling this home. I'm not going to go through. I do not have. Thank, thank you for the Google it. Thank you for the Google it. All of this uh, is discussed on TDHC. That's a brilliant. I love it. I love that. That is my newest favorite. Oh, that is my absolute newest favorite, man. Um, if that, you think, I love that. Is that you, something you just made? Because I've never seen that one before. Yeah. I love that, man. Can you combine that with classic dancing, Ryan? Because I miss that one. Oh, yeah. With Ryan doing the little. Yeah, man. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. Google it. So, <laughs> so when we so like right here, I was just talking about the Tiller Reg Z. Like that's even in here. You see this? Like it is all in there. Like this is your checklist to keep your little butt in check. And you can even see that's hyperlinked. Like TDHCA has done so much for you to try and make sure that you are doing this business correctly. Use this document. So essentially, if you screw up here. It's one, because you didn't take the time to get anything cleared up with somebody that might, if you need a lot, le real legal advice, or you just were too lazy to read this free paperwork. Yes and yes. And what I would like to say is going into this is if you really are wanting to enter, enter into this business and you're getting out there and you're feeling a little, mm, and you're needing a mentor. I am not that mentor. I do not have the patience to deal with people. But John, oh man, John Fedro. Uh, J-O-H-N, last name F-E-D-R-O, is a Texas mobile home investor that is a rock star mentor. If you want 
to learn more about this and you need somebody to hold your hand, reach out to John Fedro. He is mobilehomeinvesting.net. He's the proprietor of that website. Straight up rock star. I paid him personally to mentor me as well. I've paid two personal mentors to mentor me into this. There is no replacement in any industry for a qualified mentor. I will never say that paying for mentorships is bad. Just do your due diligence on the mentor before you pay them. Right. And, but, and, and, and a qualified inve- or a qualified mentor does not mean they're taking pictures on the hood of a rented Lambo. <laughs> right. That is more often than not probably not your qualified mentor. So that right there is your compliance review checklist, which I got over here on the slides. If I come back over here to the slides, I need to go through my consumer disclosures, which is included in the compliance review checklist. But in Texas, we are required to have consumer disclosures. Go to TDHCA. They have all of the documentation there you need to learn about this. But you can spend probably two hours on TDHCA alone just diving in and learning. I cannot spend time to teach you what somebody else is already putting forth a really good effort to do. Go out there, learn that. Purchase application with financing. I've already showed, I'll show that to you real quick. If I come back over here, this is what my paperwork looks like on that. Non-refundable deposit plus application and credit report, balance to close, agreement affected date, amount financed, monthly payments are blank, including interest per percent months, agreed price. You can see all of this. So they know up front that they're getting financed and I've given them the terms of that up front because there are laws that require specific disclosures and timelines between when you've disclosed to them the total terms of that note and closing the deal. And I do believe that is seven days. I would need to refresh my own memory, but seven days, man. Seven days is what I do believe is the required. And I need all of this signed seven days before I close the deal. Otherwise, if I close it six days in, and this was signed six days before, they may have the right to come back and hit me with some some problems. Hmm. So make sure I'm following that. Seven day wait time before I close this transaction, which I do believe will be disclosed in the consumer, in all that consumer disclosures and checklist stuff. Is that a protective barrier to make sure that they don't sign something? You know, this is an arm's length transaction? It's there to protect the buyer from a heavy-handed salesman and then being able to come back and say, (laughs) I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I signed. I I, I didn't know this. You've got seven days once you've signed all of that to basically change your mind. So so, so like on the mortgage side, it's three days. mm -hmm. This side is seven days. I was thinking it was longer. So... Three days on the, uh, what do they call that stupid thing now? They don't call it the HUD anymore. Uh, I read one. Closing disclosures, CD. So the CD, they have to have three days to review that. But on the loan application side, from the moment they sign the loan application to uh, closing the deal, it has to be at least seven days. And I believe that comes through the CFPB, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. I'm not a lawyer, not even close. I'm just a Google star. But this shouldn't be a problem for anybody. If you're trying to get into a situation where you're trying to push people to get into a place, you've, you've done a bad deal, you, you've got the wrong kind of They should of be begging you for it. You shouldn't be pushing them. You, this should always be an arm's length transaction. Mm-hmm. Very much so. So we're going to go through that. Mobile home note. I'm going to give you a short side story because whenever I was trying to get my first couple done, the first, very first one I did, I generated my own note. God, that was horrible. I should have never done that. But I did it. It went well for me. But reviewing in hindsight, God, it was horrible. I was just, when I first got started in this, I was, I was, I was your typical broke person. I didn't have the money. Right. I was just doing what I was doing. But um, moving forward from that, I started trying to find a lawyer to draft all the documents I needed, and every one I found was coming at me with kind of like that deer in headlights look and saying, yeah, I can do that for you. Just give me your credit card. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not going to pay a lawyer. Like I knew more through my own due diligence and research than what I seemed to have been finding through the lawyers that I was contacting, and I did not get that warm and fuzzy feeling. I was trying to find a mo- Lawyers are a dime a dozen, and they all have their specialties. I could not find one that specialized in mobile homes in any fashion. So I was struggling to find somebody that could provide me with what I wanted. So I got some creative thinking and got outside the box. You can call me right, wrong, or indifferent in how I did this, but <laughs> I went, have you ever heard of Yes Communities? Well, I think I know where this story's going because I think I've heard it before, but yes, I have heard of it. Yes Communities is probably one of the largest managers of mobile home parks in the United States. They have probably, you know, at least 20 to 30,000 doors, at least, assumably. I went in there, they had a mobile home for sale with financing, and I was like, I'd like to buy this from you. 
I went through all the paperwork, through the credit application, I went through all of that, went through all the paperwork, got my, got my promissory notes, I got my UCC security agreements, I got all the paperwork I needed, and during my seven day wait time to decide whether or not I wanted to complete the transaction, I decided to change my mind. But I now had all of the paperwork I needed from one of the largest resellers of mobile homes in the United States. I got all of their paperwork, and that's where I got my paperwork from. So I'm gonna show you real quick what that <laughs> mobile home note looked like. How much of your time did that take you to do? Probably about four and a half hours. So and it didn't cost me eight grand and wasted paperwork. That's what I'm getting at. That's what I'm getting at. So you took four and a half years of your life. One, you learned the whole sales process from. I it. did. And and you got all the paperwork. And you know whether it's shady or not, it doesn't really matter. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. I would agree that that was by the tried and true meaning of the word an unethical thing. But at the same time, at the position I was in, I could not afford $8,000 to sure. pay a lawyer to draft documents that I didn't have confidence in. And I didn't feel like I was truly hurting anybody in that transaction. No, and I'm not trying to cash. Uh, I'm not I, trying I'll, to I'll admit to it. I'll, I'll admit to it. The, look, every one of, everybody in this room, including Trey back there, well, I don't know if Nate, but it, but, but it starts bandit signs. Like, we've all done it. Is it technically legal? No. Mm -mm. <laughs> Is it technically ethical? I don't know. But you got to get started when you got to get started. What I look at whenever I run my day-to-day -day thing is, am I hurting somebody? And if I am, I'm not going to do it. You know, and if I'm not hurting somebody, there might be a law that says I can't do this. But if I feel like I'm truly running my business ethically and sound, and I would feel comfortable standing in front of a judge and saying, this is what I did, I'm okay with doing that. But at the point in time, I'm like, I probably don't want to tell a judge that. That's when you need to stop doing it. It's like whenever you, you need to be running your business ethically. And some people might say that that was unethical. And in the tried and true fashion of it, I would say yes. Did I hurt anybody in that process? I would say no. Yeah. So moving forward from that. That's but, it. We're not lawyers. Yeah, I'm not a lawyer. So look at this. I'll show you what this looks like. So the mobile home note agreement. So this is what it looks like. This is a very, if we pop this up here, very, very quality looking document. If I paid that lawyer eight grand, I don't think this is what I would have got, but I don't have the time to sit there and go through all this through. But what I will do is scroll through this slowly. So that way you can press pause on your Facebook. And if you're on the podcast, come back and watch it, but it's going to go through and this is going to cover all the stuff that I need to be aware of the truth and lending act. It's going to cover all of the disclosures that I need. And this is a note secured by security agreement, installment note, interest included personal property secured by security agreement for Texas. It's going to show what the finance charge is, what the total of all payments are, the amount financed, the annual interest rate, amount of payment, number of payments, when payments are due. It's going to go through. It's going to go give me all of this stuff. And on the title there, or the Truth in Lending Act, you have to disclose what the total amount paid for the full amortized value is, right? Mm -hmm. That's all covered in here, and that's why I liked this document. So I'm just scrolling through. You can push pros on this as much as you want to after the day is done. I unfortunately don't have you know, a full 40 hours to teach you all of this, but this right here is really good stuff for you to know. Two more classes and we can do that. <laughs> uh, here's my surety bond. I was a RBI, so I had to include that in here. So coming through here, this is a very strong note. That right there is my promissory note, okay? So I need that document signed. If I go back over to my slides, I'm gonna need my mobile home note security agreement. So there's a difference between your note and your security agreement, just like in real estate. In real estate, you're gonna have your real estate lien note, and you're gonna have a deed of trust if you're in a non-judicial state, and you'll have a mortgage in a judicial state. The mortgage slash deed of trust is your security instrument. That is the instrument filed of public record that gives you the right to take that home away from the buyer in the event that they default. Okay, oops. So we're gonna go through here and look at this mobile home note security agreement. Let me find that real quick. All right, so let's pop this open. This is what the security agreement's gonna look like. For anybody out there that is willing to hit pause on this enough times to retype this whole thing, I've got absolute respect for you. But we'll keep going through here. As you can see here, I've got like the words debtor and secured party. I do believe I use those as placeholders, or maybe not, maybe not, so ignore that. But if we keep scrolling through here, this is the security agreement. In Texas, we are a deed of trust state. 
but mm -hmm. deed of trusts are used for real property. Right. This is not real property, this is personal property. Personal property is governed underneath, I do believe, the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC. So a lot of the times you'll hear me refer to this security agreement as the UCC security agreement. This right here is, it is protecting my interest in that personal property. And I can file this of public record. Collateral location, alienation, replacements, insurance, property taxes. As you can see, this is a pretty detailed document. That is what I am using. Okay? Boom. All right, moving on. Going back to the slides, I'm going to need a mobile home arbitration agreement. I can show you what that arbitration agreement looks like real quick. It's just basically saying that if something goes wrong, you agree that we're going to go into arbitration. A real so simple scan. Arbitration agreement is, is something that can be overlooked. That could, that could save you a lot of money. It could save you a lots of lots of money. Going out f away from that, let's look at the next one. Application for SOL with lien. We've already discussed that earlier in this class, so I'm not going to review that again. 18-month tax statement, we've already done that. Send application for SOL in 18 months with all applicable fees to TDHCA. One clear thing I need to make sure that we do, dis do disclose and you remember is that when you file for that application for statement of ownership and location, I'll pop that open here again. I'm going to zoom in on that. If I scroll down here, right here, where is it at? Lean information. Do not forget to file the lien against that property whenever you file that SOL. If you file that SOL without putting your lien information in there, you just gave them the home. You may be able to get that fixed, but you better keep your lien on record right there. That's how you do it. Make sure you do. When I sell it, I'll click yes. I'll put my name in here as the lien holder, and I'll call the day done. So you're telling me that if, if, they, if they sell that thing, and you forget to put your lien on there, and you're like, hey, where's my check? What, what that now does is I, as the buyer, could turn around and resell that home with no encumbrance, take all the cash to my own pocket, and walk on down the road. Right. So, I mean, you see this in, on the real property side, too, where somebody forgot to file a lien. That's trouble. And, and it is, there's no judge in the world that's going to be like, yeah, let's do retroactive paperwork. <laughs> it just doesn't work like that. That is trouble. So, that, that will save you some trouble right there. So, going back to the slides yet again, that is the paperwork that you're going to need to go. That compliance review checklist, though, gives you an extra like 10 or 12 documents that I don't have here that you're going to need to go through and do, but that is all taught on TDHCA, so there's no point in me reteaching right. it. All right, so that's the paperwork you're going to need. What happens if they default on this loan? You want to so, take a quick break, or since you only have like two or three slides, just power through? The rest of this should actually go pretty smooth. It's not, they're, not, they're not detailed slides, so we've probably got another 15 minutes here. Should we stop and ask questions? Should we take a I'll break? Do a Q&A at the end. Do a Q&A at the we've end? Or, about seven, eight, ten questions lined up. All right, then let me roll through this real fast. And now we're going to talk about what happens if I sell this thing and the buyer stops paying me. What happens if the buyer stops paying me? If I only had this happen to me once where it turned into an issue and it went smooth, I didn't, I didn't have anything crazy happen, so I don't have a lot of experience on this subject. I can only disclose to you what I learned and I still have to always say, as I say with all of these classes, is conduct your own legal review, your own research, your own advisors to tell you what's going on here. But what happens when somebody stops paying me? Because that's what everybody wants to know because there's fear in that. I need to send out a 10-day cure notice of non-payment, section 94.205 of Texas Property Code. I'm not guaranteeing that. This is my own research, and this is what I've done, and I did have some, a couple of quick talks with some attorneys. Do not take anything on this slide for fact. Do your own research. Repossess home, friendly, do not disturb. Think about this, if you've got a car, and you buy it off of a car lot, and you stop making payments. When you stop making payments, what does everybody know is gonna happen? Repo man. Repo man is gonna show up and take your car. It's personal property. It's not handled like real, real property. Don't let that be held as law. That's my understanding of it. As personal property though, I can repossess it just like personal property. But it has to be friendly. It cannot disturb the peace. You can't have I imagine it'd be pretty hard to have people inside that trailer and you start dragging it down the road. You, absolutely under no situation could ever do that. You cannot show up and they be there and you tell them to get the hell out so you can take it. That's disturbing the peace. 
But if there's no one at that home and you show up, my understanding is, once again, my understanding, you pull up with the tractor trailer, you back up to it, grab a hold of it, go, you're done. You repo it. Well, so you run some risk in that. What happens if somebody's inside? Well, you need to confirm these things. I'm not going to get into that. And, the, and that's where you need to talk to your lawyer yeah. about what's the proper way to do this. Do you call a locksmith? Do you knock three times? Do you open the door? Do you make a walkthrough? Like, what's the proper steps to do what Daniel's talking about? So for, for me, luckily here, what I was able to do is I started the process going, and he just abandoned it. So it made it a little easier for me. I didn't go repossess it. I didn't have to do all of that. But I did the research to figure it out. Don't have a lot of experience here. I did have one or two consultations with some attorneys. And once again, I could not find a mobile home specific attorney that really knew the law. So I was like, I don't know if I would believe what you're telling me. Did you throw the dude cash for keys? Did he just walk away and leave the doors open and he walked in? and? Yeah, he just, he just walked away, left the door open, left the place trashed. But I was still yeah. able to, once again, clean it up, resell it, and do it again. They always leave it trashed. But repossess home, if it's friendly, like if I really, if they're like trying to squat it and they're really trying to make my life a living hell, I'm pretty sure that you can repo it just like you'd repo anything else. Uh, I'm not guaranteeing that, but if you're unable to repo it friendly, you're going to have to file an, a, 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 an eviction to get them out of the house. Uh, if they still don't leave, you'll have to get rid of possession. F file an eviction being a, a f forcible detainer suit, and then behind that would be your rid of possession. And, and just to point out, man, it's not as easy as just pulling up to it because most likely the wheels aren't on this thing. Oh, no, it's going to take a couple hours to get the so, thing out of there. So that has to be like a worst case scenario. You want to cure that before it gets to that. If I can. would never in a million years ever want to repossess a home. Quite literally, if I've got anywhere close to all of my money back and I'm getting into a position where it's going to be a flat out fight, I'm going to just look at myself and say, you know what? I've got $1,000 at risk here. It's not worth my time. I'll just leave my lien on the home. Screw you. Have a great day. I'm going to continue doing my business. It's not <coughs> worth the fight to me. Now, what would you do in the case of the lot rent situation? Uh, because they might be coming to you over the lot rent. They're not coming to me. I don't own it. Okay. I just, I'm the lien holder. That's one of the nice things about this transaction is I have no legal ownership of that home. I just have a lien against it. So if things do go south, my question will almost always be, have I got my money back yet? If not, how much am I losing? And is what I'm losing worth my time going to be to, to fight these people? Well, you know, there's some beauty there. If you have a good relationship with that uh, property manager, you get somebody else that's going to be bothering them for money. And it's not just going to be you too. You might be able to work it out and figure out some ways to get that done. Other things to think about here is have a good relationship with your buyer. You know, call your buyer up and be like, hey, man, what's going on? I just lost my job, man. I didn't want to call you. I was scared. I you know, just like daughter just broke her leg in baseball and you know i had i had to do that and then losing my job i was just like i don't know what's going on i'll be like do you foresee you getting another job in the next couple of weeks he's like well i've already got one i'm just i'm just behind well hey man we'll just call this month uh, a bad month and i'll tack that on to the end of the end of the note have a good day man i ain't trying to take your house you know if figure out what's going on with your buyer and if your buyer's just being a professional pain in the butt get rid of them but if they've truly got a problem going on and it's a short-term problem that you think you can help them resolve, help them resolve it and move on down the road. Well, so I've had this buyer that has had that happen before where it's just constantly I'm tacking stuff on the back of the note. Uh, I wouldn't say constantly. I'd be like well, once. I had to learn this lesson the yeah. hard way. I kept being the nice guy. You and know. at some point, you got to pull the ripcord on that and parachute out the back. Yeah, this the second time you mentioned it, it's no. This ain't happening twice, man. So... Um, Notice of intent to sell repossessed mobile home. Once I've repoed it and or taken possession of it, I need to file notice in, I don't recall all the details, but it has to be in like a public publication, like a newspaper or something like that. Notice of intent to sell repossessed mobile home. It has specific things that need to be in that document. Uh, and then once I have gone through that and I've sold it at the auction, which the auction could literally be the place it sits. It's like on June 19th, of 2019 at blank 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 lot number blank blank i will sell this home at public auction starting bid twenty two thousand dollars that's what's owed to me if nobody buys it i own it again can you perform the auction i'm pretty sure i can i'm not going to say i can or i can't i'm just saying pretty sure i can it'd just be fun to do um file an application for sol as a foreclosed lien and the home's mine again got that yeah so once again no guarantees on that. None whatsoever. That is my understanding from the study that I did. And fortunately for me, I didn't have to go through. Do your due diligence with your own legal 
always. Advisors. And this is Texas law. So once again, outside of Texas, this is even more so. Other strategies. So this is where we're going to talk just for a brief moment. Everything I've talked about so far is dealing with personal property, generating notes, and then using them for cash flow. But there are other things that will present themselves as possible when you're dealing with a mobile home. I can wholesale these things. Just like I can wholesale real estate, I can wholesale personal property. So I've been waiting to ask this question. When you wholesale it, does it trigger the one a year? Because you're technically Did I sell not, a mobile home? You didn't sell anything. You're just getting a ref, an assignment fee, essentially. Wholesaling is not buying and selling houses, unless you're double closing. If you're doing wholesale assignments, then you never bought real estate. You never owned it. So you did not sell it. You sold the contract. So this could be another way for somebody to get their feet wet in doing this multiple times here. No. And I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, well, if you got really creative with this, you could. Oh, okay. So um, you're saying it would be hard to do this. Well, you can wholesale. You can wholesale all day long. What, what you're talking about is trying to get away the rolling 12 months transaction. Oh, no, 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 okay. no. Okay. No. For somebody, no, I didn't, no, 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 no. Okay. You got to stay in the law on that. That's yeah. the shit, or so I'm trying, guys. It, it's good. That's the stuff that'll get you killed. Like, it'll stop your business. What I'm saying is for somebody that wants to learn this stuff, but they don't have enough money to take it down or they don't have the money partner right now, you might can find somebody to wholesale one of these two, develop that relationship with them. Mm -hmm. Then not only do you have a money partner, but you get a little cash of your own. Right there is a great example of what I would do in your shoes. You've already got a resource that has told you they like doing these deals and that they suggested you do them, your lawyer. I would go back to that lawyer and be like, hey man, if I start finding these deals for you, could we partner up on them? Yeah. Could you bring the capital? I source them, you bring the capital, we split up the monthly income. If I'm pulling 500 bucks a door off of it and he gets 250, I get 250, he gets a 60% return, you get an infinite return, boom. You got a partnership right there. That's a partner right there. They could probably have you 50 doors by the end of the year if you hustle to get it. 50 doors at 250 bucks a month is a really good return. Just some thought processes for you there. Made but, you out by there on the way out too. I would, man, I would. So other strategies, just like real estate, you can wholesale these things, but wholesaling, it's a transactional based and it creates small bumps of cash. So it's a job. You gotta constantly do it to get paid. You can rehab these things and sell them retail for cash. There's been several times where I've bought these homes with the intent to sell them on a note and somebody would come up and be like, I'll give you 18 grand cash for it right now. I'm like, oh, I'm only into it for seven. I'll take an $11,000 payday right now. Yeah, I'll sell it. Uh, but once again, it's transactional based and it creates larger bumps of cash, but it's a job. I get paid once, I don't ever get paid again. I get paid for my work, I don't get residuals. I can rent this. I need to make sure that I have my park manager's approval to rent it. Many will not allow rentals within their parks. It is difficult to get landlord's insurance for on a mobile home, so if I do have a slip and fall or something else like that, I might be putting my own personal net worth on the line for that. Uh, there's no defined ROI because tenants, tools, and trash, if the air conditioning system breaks on it and I'm making 250 bucks a month in rent off of that thing, one air conditioning problem could burn up a year and a half's worth of cash flow for me. So I don't have a defined ROI and I don't get any amortization, inflation, or appreciation benefits out of that specific asset class. If I wanted amortization, inflation, and appreciation benefits, I should invest in single family homes, not mobile homes. If I'm looking strictly for cash flow, mobile homes are a good place to rent, but it has its own caveats to problems. I would debate that with anybody any day. I would gladly debate that. Next though, and this is my preferred method, and this is what I just discussed with you for the past three, three, three classes, is generate and sell notes. It's my preferred method. You can get phenomenal returns, and if you need cash, you can liquidate your notes at, 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 at a discount, and recoup your cash and your profits all in one lump sum, use that cash to reinvest back into something else. Some resources for you to look at if you're interested in doing this, mobilehomevillage.com, mobilehome.net, mobilehomepartsstore.com, tdhca, if this then that.com, ittt.com, craigslist, lonniescruggs.net, and remember I mentioned to you John Fedro, mobilehomeinvesting.net is John Fedro's resource and he's an excellent mentor. I would personally recommend him, he mentored me. He is legit. I still, I, I think that's IFTTT. It might be IFTTT.com. But overall, that is the conclusion of this mobile home class. So moving on to, to what we got here. Do we have any final questions? I'm glad we were able to wrap this one up. <laughs> I, 
I don't even know if we have anybody else watching anymore. I know that when we go on these longer ones, they do. We start losing our interest, but the people that come back and watch it later on is phenomenal. The number of people that come back to watch it later. Paul so Shaw was asking, "How do you determine the resale price?" Uh, we discussed that earlier on, but I look at the the homes that are for rent in the area. I set my payment to match and or be close to those. And then I try to generate at least three to five years worth of income off of it. And so whatever my monthly rent is times three to five years is what I resell it for. And if that, needs, if that number seems astronomically high for the property that I have, I'll throw it out in the marketplace and let them tell me what they'll pay me for it. You can also ask the park managers, Daniel pointed out, what stuff is selling for in the park. You end. probably don't want to have something that's going to price out twice what's selling. Yep. Uh, Melissa Farr, are the tax benefits the same as single family, depreciation, et cetera, or is it different since it's owner finance? Uh, you hold the note, so you won't be able to get any of the depreciation from it. So you're the lender. You're not the owner. Uh, what are the typical rates, default rates on these loans from Sohail? I can't say typical, but out of the 30-ish that I did, two really defaulted. One of them was a real big pain, and the other one was pretty much like, man, hey, I can't afford it anymore. Um, here's the keys back. I'm sorry, but let's, 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 let's part ways and move on down the road. So I can't tell you what that is. That I can't tell you what yours will be. I ran due diligence on my buyers. I, you know, so I did a better process. You just start throwing people into doors, you might have a higher default rate. Uh, Paul was asking, what's the highest you would go with interest rates? Uh, I would never go above usurious, but I normally stayed under the double digits. I don't think I ever generated a note more than 10%. Can you quickly define usurious? Uh, Google it. I mean, usurious is essentially what the state will allow you to do. Yeah. Uh, beyond that, um, I tried to stay in single digits because whenever you're, whenever you're selling things with notes, there's, there's different levers you can pull. The number of payments, the amount of the payment, the interest rate, and the note value. And I can change any one of those to get what I want. So I don't have to have a high interest rate to get my monthly payment. So instead of throwing out an interest rate that I know most people will be like, I don't want to pay 17% interest. Well, then I'll just put a 9% interest on there and bump my, present, my, my, my value of the note up. What so, about annual property taxes? If any, do you collect them as part of the monthly payment? I do not collect those. I could escrow those and pay them myself, but several factors in there. I'm not a very detailed person. I am not a numbers guy. I get, I get bogged down in details. So I would not escrow the taxes. Taxes on a mobile home are on average between 100 to 300 bucks a year, very small. Uh, it is very, 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 very rare from my experience to find a taxing authority that would take the effort to foreclose on personal property. Uh, so I'm not saying they won't. I just I haven't because I've seen like mobile home tax liens that have been on there for like seven years. Do you, do you cure them? If, if to buy have, them, you have to cure them. No, I'm saying if you have somebody that's just not paying, do you cure them? Um, I'm probably not going to cure it. This is not my recommendation. I'm probably not going to cure it because the probability of it getting foreclosed on is not high, gotcha. and I'm not worried about it. It's like, really, this is strictly for me, and this is me only. Like, if you're going to run this into a business like your, your, little, your lawyer friend, definitely have processes and procedures and things put into place. I'm not a very detail-oriented guy. That's, that's apparent in a lot of my life. I'm not a very detail-oriented guy, but... When, when you look at, when you look at it, it's like 100 to 300 bucks a year. My notes five years. Worst case scenario, the 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 taxing authority does decide to, to foreclose bucks. on this. I'll have to fork up 1,500 bucks to get it done and take it out of my buyer's butt. You know, it's just it is what it is. I'm not going to worry about it. I don't want to deal with the headache and stress of it. I'm making my money. I'm gonna I'm just gonna ignore it. That that's a personal choice of mine. You do what you want to yeah. do. I uh, got a terminology question from Rachel. Uh, what type of property are you talking about specifically? Uh, multifam, mobile, multi fat, or uh, fabrication homes? Mobile then, homes, manufactured then, homes, yeah. uh, kind of synonymous, though they're not as titled as personal property, not real property. That's and, then, and then a follow up to that was do you guys do long term campers? Ooh. I've never done that, although I've heard people doing RVs. I have not done that, but I have heard of people buying RVs and financing them out. But I have no direct input on that so myself. I think, I think the person asked about that would be Vance. He's the man on RVs, right? Mm -hmm. I do awesome. believe so. I've heard He came in here and he taught a mobile home RV, or not a mobile home, he taught an RV class. So Vance Wampler might be somebody to talk to about that. Cool. 
Um, Rachel, again, so do you put these lease agreements on the mortgage note in the same doc? Could you say that to me one more time? So do you put the lease agreement and the mortgage note in the same document? Okay, I'm gonna have to get really technical because you're asking technical questions. There is no mortgage. It is not a mortgage, it is a UCC security agreement. Mortgage is a security instrument used to collateralize real estate lien notes on real property. Uh, this is personal property, so therefore I do not have a mortgage and the lease agreement is not for me. The lease agreement is for the park manager because the park manager is the one leasing the ground. I have nothing to do with that lease. And then wouldn't it be, and then she's talking about the, the or Jeremiah is talking about the repo. Wouldn't it be similar to repo like a car since they are both personal property? That is my understanding. My understanding is also that it has to be a friendly repo and that since there are personal items within the car, um, depending on my UCC security agreement, I do have the rights, if it is stated in my UCC security agreement, I do have the right to keep the contents of the mobile home as long as it's not like personal items such as like family photos, tools that they use for work such as like their, their, their tool bags and stuff like that, but in their clothes. But I believe everything else in the house is fair game, my understanding, consult an attorney. And then also watch part one, part two for, because I know we went, spent about 20, 30 minutes on that topic. Covered yeah. most of these things. Yeah. Um, is the interest rate limit, is the interest rate limit based off of APOR, like single family owned under financing? Not to the best of my knowledge. I'm not going to say yes or no to that, but I do not believe so. This is personal property. Uh, Thomas, can you buy the tax debt and get the property? Ooh. I'm not going to answer that. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. And then uh, Rachel, she was following up on one of the earlier. She was following up on the earlier. She was saying, I was assuming you were the park owner. No, these scenarios that we're talking about is me as an investor entering into somebody else's mobile home park, trying to find mobile homes that I can purchase for around whatever, whatever number you look for. I personally look for around eight grand find mobile homes I can buy for eight grand, turn around and then resell on a note and transfer ownership to a new buyer and collect yield payments monthly for the full term of that note. So, Also known as Lonnie deals. So you, have you ever bought a park? I have master lease option to park. I don't know even know what that is. It's like, it sounds like magic. It's like a lease option, except like I took the whole thing at something. I'm not sure how that happens. But so are you familiar with lease options? Kind of. I don't know watch much about Friday's it. Show. Okay, I'll real, watch Friday's Real, real fast, very short. Lease option says, I will rent you this property, and you have the option to buy it from me at this set price within this period okay. of time. Lease option. So, Master lease option is, I'm agreeing to rent this entire park from you for this price and I have the option to buy this entire park from you for this price for this time. So there was a, a mobile home park that was in trouble. I didn't want to deal with transferring title because there were some grandfathered issues with the park that I didn't mm. want to deal with, as well as over usage of the land issues that I didn't want to deal with. But I wanted the cash flow from it because I knew I could make about 2,500 bucks a month in income off of it and have no money out of my pocket. So it was free cash. So I master lease optioned it, took control of the entire park without owning it. What's your exit strategy on that? How'd you get out of it? Just cash flow. If at any point in time I don't want it, the option for me to cancel it, it reverts back to him. It's his problem now. And until but, it stops, I make money. But you're not having to deal with the grandfathered issues or anything? that Because I never transferred title. Okay. So that makes sense. So because, whew, that's, that's a gold nugget right there. Mm -hmm. So if you, anybody is listening right now, I'm intimately aware of this and had to deal with this over the last few weeks because of certain issues that popped up in my life. There are several things that can cause a grandfather to go away. Mm -hmm. One of them is transfer a title. And that's not fun. Well, it well, is what it is. It yeah. becomes an issue you have to work through. If, if you, you don't, don't know work, about it and you're not prepared for it, it's not I fun. learned this the hard way this last week. So, you know, y'all take that as a gold nugget that Daniel just dropped on y'all and know that when you're sitting there talking to a seller, he's like, nah, I'm grandfathered in. <laughs> you might not be the moment that transfers title. Mm -hmm. and, and Daniel just gave you a different way to look acquire at that. property. So I've owned that one for probably close to six years now and I've cash flowed it for close to six years now. The part of this business is knowing what you don't know and knowing what you do know. And you know, going in and doing my due diligence on that park, I was fortunate enough to know that 
you know, I might have deed restrictions. I might have county restrictions. So I went and talked to my zoning commission, planning and development, and I went and found out what was going on. And that's where I found out all that. And that's where I transitioned from buying the park subject to, to buying the park under a master lease option. So I never triggered a do on sale or not do on sale, but a, a transfer of, of ownership. Well, there's, there's two parts of that. So there's two, two ways you're going to approach the county or the city when you're dealing with this, right? You either go in and try to ask as few questions as you can so you don't get everybody's I want to ruffle feathers. I don't want to ruffle feathers, but I want to. I want to beat the dead horse until I know for a fact I'm not screwing myself. So like I said in my meeting last night with this city, that's been very awesome. I want to be clear; they've been awesome to us. I went in and literally just asked, "Can you get everybody that has a stake in this? I want every stakeholder here. Can we get them here as soon as possible? Let's get it all out in the open." All right. It's been the best situation it could have been because of that. I, I love hearing that, man. It's it's it's. They can be your best friends or your worst enemies. Sure. And it's your choice to figure out who they're going to be. And sometimes there's just cities that you won't be able to deal with. Absolutely. They have their own issues. They have their own prerogatives. And you're not going to be able to get past that. But when you find one that wants to work with you, man, there's no there's no better feeling than being able to go into a city and be like, hey, this is what I want to do. And not only do they re reciprocate that, but give you the path to make it happen. So, so because Daniel went in respectfully and with an open kind of spirit here about what he was trying to do with this deal, he got the answers he needed figured out it couldn't be done without a monetary burden that wouldn't have made it work for anybody. And he's worked out a scenario that's helping the gentleman that owned it, it's mm -hmm. helping you. And I'd be willing to build a tub in the city because you're probably gradually having to fix stuff through CapEx and some other situation. So exactly the point. So it was a win-win situation across the board. And if it wasn't for the fact that I was aware of how to structure a master lease option, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Uh, Richard Wilkin on YouTube. I see mobile home parks for sale how would you ideally structure a purchase? That is a whole class on its own. Mobile home park, that, that's like a whole class on its own. Everything I've done was mobile home parks, mobile homes as personal property. Uh, mobile home park is real estate, not personal property, and it is a commercial real estate transaction with a long list of due diligence items that need to be structured. And I could do a class on that if you'd like me to. I'm sure people would love that. Next one. Anna, and I think this is the last one. All right. Uh, I got a free mobile home once from park manager that needed rehab. All she wanted was to have the tenant for that lot. Would have loved to know what Scored. I just learned and finance it instead of selling it. That right there, you, you, you probably could have tripled your returns, quadrupled your returns uh, on that transaction, knowing how to do this. And I am very glad to hear that not only you see this as an opportunity, but you've already thought of ways to implement this. And that brings me back to what we are here at Propelio. Propelio is a software company that provides tools to real estate investors. And what you see here, these interviews we do with people like Jason, these classes that we put on, is all to bring awareness to our software company. So if you have watched this or you are watching this, please do us the favor of going out and checking out Propelio.com. We offer websites for real estate investors, lead lists in specific markets, as well as access to MLS comparable sales, uh, discounted MLS properties, lead management. There's several things and resources that we have there, and I would love it if y'all went out there and took a look at that. If you enjoyed the education that you received today, this was more of an impromptu class, kind of a you know kick it back and forth and figure out what's going on. But if you are liking the education that you're receiving from Propelio, Propelio just launched in October the Propelio Academy, which is a free online resource to educate real estate investors, not only how to do real estate investing, but how to do it ethically. And and everything from creative financing, subject to wraps, short sales, pre-foreclosures, RV parks, the list goes on and on. We've got CPAs coming in here going through taxes, taxes and insurance strategies. We've got lawyers coming in going through asset protection. We've got everybody that we can possibly think of coming in and teaching detailed classes, step-by-step -step actionable classes on how to get started in real estate investing and for the seasoned investors, how to well round your tool belt out. And we provide all of that at no cost to you. So go out there, check out the academy. Go out there and check out the software. And thank you all for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, check out our podcast. And overall, if you're enjoying what you're seeing here, if you truly believe that we're providing you the value that, that you are not finding other places, reciprocate that by telling everybody that you know that we're out here doing this. We do this as brand awareness and we do this to let everybody know that we are in this industry and we're here to help. Any final thoughts? I'd like to thank you guys. 
um, all the folks here at Propelio over the last year just knowing you guys and being part of y'all's masterminds other stuff has enabled me and my family to change our life it's introduced me to the business partners I have I love it man um, I... it's it's and it's literally I know that's what you you guys live for um, but but literally me and my wife took a turn from circling the drain trying to figure out how to do this stuff to being put with the people that helped us get out of that I love hearing that man I know you've you have more than once said that and it's it's very rewarding it's it's hard for me to put into words how that feels because i remember being in your shoes circling the drain not knowing what was going on and scrambling to try and find a way out and i didn't have that person to reach out to well and and, and if in, and nobody understands the kind of personal connection that happens with propelio here and how much they want to try to help people when i was scrambling at one point these guys gave me signs to go put out because yeah. they knew i was in trouble like they've done other stuff to help me they put me at the right people i've called ryan and he's got now they can't always do that but you have a wealth of a community that's been built around propelio here the last year ultimately last year i think you were really just getting started last year right um of all of these people nationwide that you can reach out to by just going out and and typing on a facebook group there's not many other places you can do that. And I promise if you go to BP and get in there and you say the wrong thing, they'll flame you up one side and down oh, the other. Yeah. So take advantage of this network. Look, I don't mind talking crap about them. They're, 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 I'm just laughing because I dropped a link to some of theirs earlier. Uh, they, <laughs> they always beat, I always get beat up in the threads because I didn't say it the right way. So my, do I. my point is, I've never been beat up when we talk with this community that's developed here this is a welcoming place ask the stupid questions i ask him all the time he's told me i'm lazy before other people have told me i'm lazy and ultimately they've been motivating me to go do other stuff to get better so take advantage man i hope y'all get as much benefit out as i have there is just no way for me to reciprocate that in any way or the explanation of how i feel because everything that you just described is what i was looking for whenever i was failing in this business i was looking for somebody that could lift me up and i didn't find it and that's what that's that's what we have found and built here it is a resource for investors that are struggling to gather the knowledge that they need to succeed i can i can tell you i can i mean i can show you the text message i keep in my phone where I hounded Ryan into letting me come to that first mastermind. <laughs> and, and that's where I met the, the people that I've partnered with and, and we've made our way out. Well, awesome, man. Much respect for you and yours. I'm glad to hear that y'all are on the right path now. Y'all are moving back up the right way. And I look forward to nothing but your success. How can we get hold of Jason? Follow me on Facebook, the.jason.witherspoon, I think is what it is. It's that, there's only two of us. One of them is uglier than me, so pick me. <laughs> um, <laughs> well awesome man thank you everybody for still watching i don't know how many of y'all were able to stick through that entire class but i appreciate those of that did uh don't forget to check out part one and part two uh overall this is probably close to a 10-hour class um you know this this was not something we would have normally done i promised the uh, rei community here locally that i would perform a class for them live and i was unable to do that class and since i was unable to perform that class live i chose to do it here on this set but take advantage of it rewind it enjoy it dig in have fun have a good one <laughs>